suppose, which can help those who find themselves in need of immediate assistance. Plymouth Railway Station is the first to provide these kits along with a private room. These small interventions make a huge difference to those who are managing these conditions and I hope that more locations will follow. I would like to congratulate the support group for all th and all their partners as they work with the service to provide. And I've got a copy uh, or a pack of the kit here with me. Um, and there's pretty much everything in there you'd need if you were caught short. And these packs are handed out, but there are also um, packs of clothes for men and women down at the railway station. And this is a fast in the country. So Plymouth is a fast. And it was great to recognize that this morning. So if you want to have a look at that kit, I'll have it for you later on. Thank you. Lida, do you have any announcements? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I have a number of important and varied announcements today for full council. The first is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Marine Park. We have now appointed an interim Chief Executive for the National Marine Park. Elaine Hayes is an environmentalist with a brilliant track record of leading nature and conservation organisations and brings with her a vast wealth of knowledge and experience. We have some really exciting times ahead with a lot of different ambitions and projects to deliver in this sector. We want to plan for a more sustainable future, but also inspire and enthuse our residents to enjoy our newly created National Marine Park. And I'm really looking forward to working with Elaine, as I'm sure many of my colleagues here today will be. The second announcement is with regards to Shekinah. We have been working closely with Shekinah, which is a charity organization in Plymouth that provides opportunities for people who are experiencing all forms of homelessness and indeed other challenges. They help people to make meaningful changes in their lives with specialist support to address health issues, getting a home, and learning new skills to lead to employment. With them, we are hoping to turn the empty Stonehouse Community Centre at Stonehouse Creek into a new type of community centre, bringing all types of services into one safe space. The new venture will include offerings such as skills training, health promotion, education, employment services, housing advice, mental health support, as well as additional counselling. Shekinah truly have an incredible track record of changing lives of many people in Plymouth for the better, and we're keen to support them with their continuing work. This move will bring a, le a new lease of life to a current vacant building, but it also means we can continue with our long-term goal to regenerate the Mill Bay area and the boulevard. The new boulevard has really opened up the area and with a new hotel being built, means that all, this is all good news for the city, the economy, and of course our residents. Moving to Omicron grants, Plymouth hospitality, leisure, and accommodation businesses that have been impacted by COVID-19 will now be able to apply for a further financial support through us. The government announced the new Omicron hospitality and leisure grant on the 21st of December to help support businesses in this sector that have been impacted over the Christmas and New Year period. The team here at Plymouth City Council have worked quickly to get the latest business grant scheme up and running, and we're now working on plans for the discretionary grant scheme as we want to make sure we understand where the support is really needed, uh, most of all, and of course, how we can make sure that funding is available and has the very best of impact on these businesses, my Lord Mayor. Moving to Historic England grant, I'm delighted to announce that we've also received the news that Historic England are giving us an increase to the existing High Street Heritage Action Zone grant. We will be getting an extra £130,000 for the Historic Announcements project within Old Town Street and New George Street. This is truly excellent news to help with the delivery of this important project within our town centre. Moving now to the Tamar Bridge petition, the Tamar Bridge and Tor Point Ferry provide vital transport links between Devon and Cornwall, and many residents, businesses, and visitors are reliant on such links. Efforts have been made repeatedly to lobby the government for support for general maintenance and improvements in line with health and safety measures. We know how important this is. We made it one of our commitments, commitment number 55, to consult you, the people of Plymouth, about the possibility of reducing or abolishing the tolls on the Tamar Bridge and Torpoint Ferry crossings 
by lobbying the government to secure similar status to the Severn Bridge crossing. It's all about people power, my Lord Mayor, so we're keen to use the power of the people so the continued cost is not a burden on local taxpayers. We have chosen to use the change.org petition website to raise the profile and we hope that the public support for this important matter will be very strong going forward. This demonstrates we are genuinely representing local people and we will publicise the petition further when it has been launched and I hope everyone in attendance here today will support this initiative and sign the petition. My final announcement is arguably the most important and the most current. It's with regards to the right ribbon accreditation. In recent weeks, I have met with a number of local organizations who provide vital and valuable support to the victims of violence against women and girls here in Plymouth. All have emphasized that the council must take this matter seriously. And of course we do. It's a priority for us. I have already established the Violence Against Women and Girls Commission, which I know we are discussing later on the agenda, and they are working at pace under the leadership of Councillor Rebecca Smith. I would like to thank her and all Commission members, including Nazir Afzal, for getting this moving so quickly, and I would encourage everyone to take a moment to complete the Commission survey, which is currently live on the Council website and has been shared on various other social media platforms. However, the work must not, stop, must not stop whilst the Commission scrutinises what is being done in the city and what needs to happen in the future. We already have a huge programme of projects and activities being delivered under our Safer Streets programme, and I want the Council, as an organisation, to also look at its own services and operations. Therefore, my Lord Mayor, I am announcing today that we will be moving forward with our plans to achieve white ribbon accreditation. Achieving white ribbon status as an organisation will further demonstrate that we are best placed to help our residents in combating violence against women and girls, and we must champion this important issue. Council staff continue to work tirelessly for our residents, and this accreditation will demonstrate and enhance the skills and knowledge of our workforce in addressing violence in our communities. My Lord Mayor, in addition, I will be booking myself onto the accredited bystander training course as soon as possible, and I would encourage all other members here today to attend this important training course. That concludes my announcements today, my Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Jonathan Dream. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd like to make an announcement today about our uh, exciting Transforming Cities Fo Future programme. I'm pleased to announce that we have signed a two key contracts on the flagship Mobility Hubs project. Firstly, a contract has been signed with Barrel Bikes to provide a network of electric bikes that will become operational across the city in 2023, with over 400 electric bikes becoming available to be hired by the local residents. Secondly, 300 parking bays across the city will be installed to electric vehicle charging points provided by Gama Energy Limited. Over 100 of these will have rapid charges available of providing a typical electric vehicle with an additional 100 mile range in approximately 30 minutes. Thirdly, we have completed the tender process for the e-car club element of the Mobility Hubs project, and I look forward to making further announcements on that shortly. Lord Mayor, the Mobility Hubs project will provide much needed low carbon travel options for the residents of Plymouth, and it clearly helps us support our climate ambitions, which we're discussing later today. Regarding EV charging also, from today, Plymouth City Council have started an exciting venture to increase the use of EV vehicles, electrical vehicles, in the city. While a majority of us, this will be an easy transformation, we must remember the residents and visitors who may have a mobility impairment, and this is less straightforward for them. Just imagine the difficulties of a wheelchair person with, with trying to plug in the heavy cables, etc., for the car. So from today, our parking team have recognized this, and I'm delighted that we are starting a trial in the Theatre Royal car park 
of assisted electric vehicle charging. This scheme will allow car park users who have a mobility impairment to park in a vehicle charging bay and use the telephone number provided to seek assistance from the staff on duty and help them complete the task. We will be accessing the assessment of the successful scheme over the coming months and we'll be consulting with our partners across the city to replicate it where we can. Further support works have been undertaken with our disability community and we'll be following up with more initiatives and discussing those with them. Uh, under the Transforming City Futures 2 scope of works, closely working with the Department of Transport, we are developing a new CCTV control room that will bring together the traffic, traffic signalling team and also the wider CCTV surveillance arrangements. This will see new hardware and software to future-proof the service and the development of key partnerships in sustainable transport network and in the enforcement to help Plymouth move forward safer and develop a more efficient transport network. Plymouth City Council has also been awarded £80,000 by the Department of Transport to progress plans encouraging more people to take up walking and cycling for their health and well-being. The fund will also be used as a feasibility study to our socially prescribed walking and cycling, where health providers, link workers and community groups work together to help people provide their personal activity meeting their goals. The Council's transport and public health teams have been working hard with partners across the city over the next few months as well to put together a proposal that will aim to get more people walking and cycling. If successful, Plymouth will receive funding for a three-year pilot programme that will help more people access support such as cycle training, lead rides, lead walks and complementary programmes like bike maintenance courses as well. The funding for the feasibility programme allows two competitive bid rounds with Ply Plymouth being one of the highest scored out of all the councils in the last run. I'd also like to announce the reopening of the George Park and Ride passenger facility. The George Park and Ride terminal building will reopen on the 31st of January. This building will be open Monday to Friday, except bank holidays, from 6.30 till 3 o'clock, and will be staffed by Plymouth City Bus. Responsibilities of the staff on site will include, but not be limited to, provision of information to customers of all modes of sustainable transport, general overseeing of bus services, daily cleaning of the building and litter picking of the car park as well, dealing with customer feedback and passing it on to the appropriate body, reporting any site difficulties to the relevant body and ensuring that compliance with COVID-19 is maintained. Unfortunately, we're not able to open the building on Saturdays at present, but longer hours will be opened up as soon as we're able to in the city, especially with large events taking place. And the last one is uh, the bus shelter contract has been uh, tendered uh, on the 14th of January with a view to the contract being awarded at the end of May. And I believe an email has gone out to all councillors affecting the wards there. The key requirements from the new contract will be provision of a high quality infrastructure, meeting accessible standards, a move to digitalised advertising, maintenance and cleaning of infrastructure, environmental and social considerations, including green roofs at some locations and environmental lighting, and for the council to receive a share of the advertised revenue and the final one, Lord Mayor, the uh, Morley Drive Access Improvement Scheme has started today. Um, it's a scheme to help public transport access the hospital. It's um, going to take a while, it's just over a year. Morley Drive sits on the west side of the hospital, is currently narrow with a 300 metre stretch of single carriageway and links Breast Road with the hospital itself. 
It's home to the Glenbourne unit, the ambulance station and Thornbury Centre and has access to the multi-storey car park. In, it is too narrow for all the traffic that's there at the moment, which is why we need to make it wider and there'll be a bus gate there to improve the um, self-sustainability of the bus services. Thank you, Lord Mayor. That was it. Thank you, Councillor Dream. Councillor Mrs Vivian Pengelly. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as many of you will be aware, Holocaust Memorial Day remembers the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust. It also commemorates and remembers the millions of other people killed under Nazi persecution and in subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. I am pleased that Holocaust Memorial Day is marked annually by Plymouth City Council as a civic event. This year, we will mark Holocaust Memorial Day by a civic commemoration ceremony with civic dignitaries and a public commemoration. The Association for Jewish Refugees has been very kind in providing a tree which will be planted opposite the Peace Garden as part of the 80 Trees for 80 Years campaign to help mark this, this occasion. I wish to invite you to join us in the Peace Garden on the Hoe at 11.15 on Thursday the 27th of January for the public commemoration. We have worked closely with Plymouth Centre for Faith and Cultural Diversity to organise these events and so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for their commitment. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pengeli. Councillor Mark Deacon from Home. Thank you, Lord Mayor. You're on our screens now. I have five um, announcements to make. I shall try and um, be um, succinct about it. Um, the first one is the library service. The school's library service is pleased to report that over the Christmas and New Year period, 600 topic boxes were collected from schools and a further 400 topic boxes were collected from schools and a further Sorry, were delivered. Each of these 1,000 topic boxes contained a collection of 25 books on a related topic that school staff used to, to enhance learning. In total, the, um, the FLS staff based at Thornton Way collected and distributed 25,000 books over three weeks. The school's library service also recently We seem to have frozen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, councillors, we've lost the link. Um, Councillor Mark Deacon froze on that one. So um, we're going to have to move on. Are there any other announcements from cabinet members or committee chairs? Councillor Chaz Singh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it gives me great pleasure to announce that under this administration as the Chair of Taxi Licensing that there are no further increases to private hire or hackney carriages for the year 22 and 23. So I would encourage all councillors, if they know people who want to apply as taxi drivers and uh, put up the numbers and serve the city uh, and its visitors, um, it's a really good opportunity to encourage that. So thank you to my vice chair, members of the committee and council officers and staff. Um, we have re-established Councillor Deacon's link. We're just going back to Councillor Deacon from home. Councillor De Deacon, um, we've got you back now. Would you like to ask your, or do your announcements?
Well, I don't know what happened there, but we're moving on anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure whether the link has broken down or what's happened. It's technology for you, isn't it? Right, I'd like to go to item seven. And uh, I move that uh, item seven, the council tax base setting for 22-23 and the council tax support scheme for 22-23. Councillor Kelly, would you like to introduce this report? Thank you, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Um, this report is to enable members to approve the council tax base for the year 22-23. Um, approving the council tax base hopefully today is an important step towards setting the council tax for the financial year 22-23. The council tax tax base for 22-23 is based on the total housing stock as at October 2021. By its very nature, this is a very technical report, my Lord Mayor. The tax base is, in essence, the estimated number of dwellings in the authority modified to take account of the different proportions, payable, discounts, and other reductions. The council tax base is also used by the preceptors, those being the fire and police authority, to determine their council tax income for the 22-23 uh, year. As an example, if a new house is built and is occupied by one adult for council tax base purposes, this will equate to 0.75% of a property due to the fact that the occupier will receive a 25% single person's discount. Included in the calculation is an assumption for the non-collection of council tax within the year, and the assumed collection rate this year will be 97.5% as it was in the previous year. The collection rate remains the same, as I've said, and takes into account recent arrears, collection performance, and the pattern of write-offs, and importantly, the impact of universal credit. A collection rate of 97.5% is therefore deemed realistic and prudent in the current economic climate. I'm pleased to say that the tax base for Plymouth City Council has increased by some 715 uh, equivalent properties compared to last year, which clearly demonstrates that we are providing more homes within the city and that will enable us to collect more council tax. And the average band D base is forecast to be 73,830 properties. Following the abolition of the National Council Tax Benefit Scheme in 2013, Plymouth in implemented two local assistance schemes council tax support and a discretionary exceptional hardship scheme. The main council tax support, or CTS as it's referred to, uh, requires all working age claimants to make a minimum 20% contribution to their council tax bill. The CTS scheme follows the basic calculation for housing benefit and is based on a means test. I'm pleased that the report recommends the continuation of the current council tax support scheme for 22-23 for those that have the most financial impact and hardship. My Lord Mayor, I recommend this report to full council today and I hope that all members can support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Councillor Vivian Pengeli, I understand you're a second in this report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right to... Uh, Lord Mayor, I formally second the report. And you reserve your right, Councillor Pengeli? Yeah. Would anyone else like to speak on this item? Councillor Pemberthy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this would normally be the point at which Councillor Lowry would, would step up, but um, I'm subbing for him today. Um, Obviously, we would support this because it is, as uh, we have been told, a technical paper, but would like to just raise a few quick points, if I may. Um, obviously, I'm very proud of our plan for homes and work very hard on it. I'm glad to see that the aspiration we brought in as an administration of achieving a 1,000 homes a year on average has made such an important difference to the council tax revenue available for the council, and I just wanted to... To, sit, to say that I'm pleased that that is continuing and we need to keep that continuing in order to ensure our council tax base remains healthy. 
I'm also pleased that the Council Tax Support and Exceptional Hardship Scheme, which I personally worked on over a number of years, has uh, stood the test of time, especially last year where we took a whole series of amendments through that would mean we had to do less technical adjustments each year, thus saving um, time and effort in, in terms of the benefits system we operate. And the fact that we've got no amendments this year shows that those amendments made last year have, have proven useful. So um, I'm pleased for that and to say a big thank you to all of the staff team involved in making that happen. Finally, I'd just like to raise a point of caution about an assumed collection rate. We keep on hearing about a cost of living crisis. We don't know exactly what might or might not happen in government, but at the moment, over March and April, expected rises in utilities bills, broadband connection bills, um, national insurance rates, council tax rates, are going to be hitting everyone in the city hard, and more people are going to have to be choosing about where they spend their money. I trust that we are able to achieve our collection rate, but would recommend that the council thinks hard, or the administration thinks hard, about what to do if those rates drop because of the impact of the cost of living rise. And I know that was something that was discussed in the last child poverty working group, which you and I both attended. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pemberthy. Are there any further um, contributions Councillor Kelly, would you like to sum up? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. As is detailed in the report and has, as has been outlined during the discussion, Plymouth continues to grow its housing stock and I'm delighted that the uh, calculation for the council tax base is increasing again this year. Clearly, we don't want people who have financial hardship to worry unduly and there is support available for those through the schemes that I've previously identified and would encourage people to seek that uh, reassurance and indeed the financial support if and, if and when is required. I'd also like to draw attention to the empty homes premium. We as a city council are very keen to ensure that all properties are fit for habitation and as you will see under the empty homes premium uh, there are charges involved with council tax that would encourage landlords uh, to get that property back into use uh, that will benefit families and residents of people in Plymouth rather than leaving them um, derelict or neglected and unoccupied. So in essence, the report is positive. Um, I note Councillor Pember these concerns with regards to the collection rate. I think with the support that has generally been given um, by this council and indeed the government over recent months with regards to COVID, uh, the collection and indeed the financial support and payment generally has not fallen off a cliff edge, which was a concern. So let's hope that can continue. And I'd recommend that everybody supports this to go forward with a very important step with regards to setting our council tax in the future. Thank you very much, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. We're going to move to take a recorded vote. So I'm passing over to my advisor who will take this vote. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll ask for councillors alphabetically and if you could uh, advise for, against or uh, abstain. I'll start. Councillor Allen. Four, sorry. Four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs. Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr. Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Churchill. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corvid. Four. Councillor Cresswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Gosling. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Lang. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Lowry. Oh, sorry, absent. Councillor Dr Mahoney. Four. 
Councillor Macdonald. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neil. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Partridge. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Four. Councillor Pemberthy. Four. Councillor Mrs. Pengelly. Four. Councillor Rennie. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Singh. Uh, my top working group four. Councillor Shea. Five. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakeham. Councillor Mrs. Um, Councillor Ms. Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Lord Mayor. Not voting. Uh, carried 46 for one abstention. That's, this motion is carried 46 for and one abstention. Um, I move to item eight on the agenda the Tamar Bridge and Tall Point Ferry future financing. Councillor Dream, would you like to introduce your report? Thank you, Lord Mayor, members. The strategic importance of the Tamar crossings is to the local economies of both Plymouth and Cornwall, not to be taken lightly, nor can we ignore the need of so many people who use these crossings in pursuit also of leisure activities. We must always remember that these are Tamar crossings, both a bridge and a ferry, and that the ferry serves the entire Rame Peninsula, not just Tor Point. There have been toll increases in 1996, two, uh, 2010, and 2019. It was anticipated that tolls would not need to go up, I beg your pardon, tolls would not need to go up until 2023-24. However, because of COVID and the associated loss of income, an urgent toll increase was planned and initiated in 2020. This, however, was stopped when the government sent three million pounds down for lost income. Despite the support and the funding, the Tamar Bridge and Tall Point Ferry undertaking still has some three million pounds down on the pre-COVID forecasts and the deficit is growing. The bridge opened to the traffic in 1961 with three lanes and it was extended with the addition of two additional lanes in 2001 that has allowed for the growth in traffic due to car ownership. The ferry in the 60s had the capacity of 28 cars. In the 80s, the ferries were stretched to take 50 and the current more modern ferries now take 73. So we can see the growing importance of their services for the Rain Peninsula. Traffic levels are just less than 90% as customer travel habits have changed with more working from home and less commuting as a result of each COVID. Each 1% of traffic that we're down on is the approximate 150,000 pounds per annum. So if we're down 10% on the forecasted levels, that's about 1.5 of annual income. The bridge handles 16 million vehicles a year. That's round about 40,000 cars a day and, and lorries and buses. The ferry handles 2.4 million vehicles a year. That's about 5,500 per day and provides a service for local bus operators and more importantly, we must remember the Blue Lights emergency services 24-7, 365 days a year. Over the last few years, significant works totaling £17 million have been carried out at both crossings. These have included painting, curbs, and more recently, the resurfacing works. Other works have included the update of the tolling system, which includes the modern tolling system Tamar Tag, which also is the introduction recently of contactless payments on the bridge, 
and there are plans to have these provided contactless payments at the ferry this year. These projects have all been essential to the long-term and safe delivery of the service. The bridge operates under the 1957 Tamar Bridge Act, which sets out a user pays basis to pay for the operation, maintenance and improvements of the crossings. This needs to be looked at, updated and revised in the very near future. On this front, we have made, raised this matter with the DFT through Johnny Mercer MP. However, DFT were not agreeable into looking at the contribution to the maintenance of the bridge. We will, through the Tamar Bridge and Torpoint Ferry Committee and the respective councils, continue to lobby for support. We are looking for a long-term solution to fund the crossings and hope that the TFT will finally recognise this after years of requests by this and previous committees. The DFT says the A38 is the main strategic arterial gateway into Devon and Cornwall. So it's only fair that they should contribute. The joint chairs of the committee have written to all the MPs in Plymouth and Cornwall asking for their help and their support and lobbying the DFT on this topic. We have asked also for consultants to come Can in. Councillor Dreen, the time is up. Can I just ask you to finish that last sentence, please? Certainly. We've also asked for consultants to come and review the impo uh, operations and to use the assets to see if we've missed any opportunities to generate savings in the future. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dreen. Councillor Pat Patel, I understand you're seconding this report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right to speak? Can I reserve my right to speak? Thank you, Councillor Patel. Would anyone else like to speak on this item? Uh, Councillor Kevin Neal. Thank you. Um, I first came to this city about 20 years ago, Lord Mayor, um, and spent a great many years of my life living in Basildon in Essex. Um, so I'm very familiar uh, with the history of developing uh, river crossings, um, including the, the Dartford Tunnel, which I we remember well it being built um, as an addition to the, the, the Dartford Bridge. Um, now, of course, no part of any of the cost of providing or maintaining the services between Dartford and Essex fell on the local taxpayers. And it's always been my view that no part of that should ever fall um, on the hands of people who live in this area. I don't think we should be treated any differently from people who live in other areas where there are integral uh, river crossings which are part of the national road network, which we are. Um, and it pains me greatly um, that, for example, a second homeowner in Cornwall uh, who benefits from the crossing may be taking no responsibility, what's, responsibility whatsoever for its existence. Um, so that is really what I would say to, to the leader um, and to the relevant committee chairs, that, that this is something we know our MPs have supported us, um, but we just need to reinforce that and we need to say that absolutely no way should any part of this particular crossing fall to our responsibility or our residents' responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neil. Councillor Philip Partridge. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I just add um, a thanks to the committee for getting through a difficult resolution and also to note that um, it was made much harder by only having two former members uh, from previous committees sat on the current one and a lot of information from previous committees having to be repeated at great expense and t of time to newer members in order to bring um, newer members up to speed with what's being done, uh, particularly around the unique governance of the bridge. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Councillor Margaret Corvid, please. <coughs> Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, strategic national infrastructure, that's what the bridge and the ferry are. And I just want to echo the points that have been made by uh, fellow members about the fact that this should, in all reasonable thought and understanding, be something that the government pays for, you know, when it is the strategic gateway into Cornwall. Um, and I just want to highlight the fact that we are being constrained by circumstances that we have this responsibility to make sure that these services remain operational, um, and particularly the ferry. I just want to say that if the ferry were to have a rate hike or if services were to be restricted there, um, Plymouth would suffer, but the Rain Peninsula would suffer even more. Torpoint would suffer. Uh, Cornwall is a beautiful place. The Rain Peninsula is a beautiful place, but it is suffering economic devastation and privation. And it's very, very important that people who need to take up employment in Plymouth, including in strategic places like the dockyard and people who need to access services here, particularly at Dareford Hospital, are able to get here in a way that is safe and convenient, but is also affordable. So um, I just really want to encourage everyone to support uh, this decision today uh, because until the government wakes up and decides that strategic national infrastructure should be supported nationally, this is the best choice that we can make to preserve this vital link for both Plymouth and Cornwall. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corvid. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Mark Coker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I appreciate the um, overview that Councillor Dring gave to us today, and I echo everything that he said. I would like to say that no one in this chamber, and I'm sure in Cornwall, um, look forward to increasing tolls on the bridge. The last two years during the COVID pandemic has been extremely difficult for the Torpoint and Tamar Bridge Committee and officers to find a way forward. It's really about a unique situation here with the bridge and the ferry ser serving different communities. The, the ferry and the, and the bridge operate uh, in tandem to provide a cost uh, service on a user pay principle. What worries me, Lord Mayor, is that the government have, around the country, subsidized or taken over bridge crossings. What worries me, if we get uh, a subsidy or the, um, or the government does take over the bridge, uh, the likelihood that they would take over running a ferry operation is a different matter. And then I worry about the future of the ferry and the cost of the residents that um, have to um, come across the Tamar, both at Devonport, Port Point, and the Rain Peninsula. I think there is a lot of cross-party work going on with Councillor Dreen myself to actually put forward the case, but sometimes what you wish for, you don't always get, and I just need to think that we need to be aware that um, we, we need to work really closely to ensure and safeguard the, the ferry operation. Um, Lord, Lord Mayor, uh, I think I would, it would also be remiss of me not to pay tribute to as Councillor Dreen referred to, the previous committee under the uh, chair or joint chairmanship of Councillor Wheeler and also ex-Councillor Sam Tamlin and ex-Councillor Jeff Brown in Cornwall, who during the pandemic worked tirelessly to put forward the case to government. And I would urge the government on their levelling up agenda 
this is a strategic nature, uh, a strategic crossing, and if ever there was leveling up needed, it was here. Lord Mayor, I support these recommendations, but with some reservations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coker. Councillor Nick Kelly. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We've had some good debate and discussion. I think everybody in this chamber is uh, very aware of the cost of living and indeed uh, the additional costs that fall on local residents that need to use the bridge or ferry crossings regularly with regards to their home uh, business commute and place of work. What I would echo is that uh, any increase is carefully thought through and clearly the joint uh, committee is both cross-party as well and none of us particularly want to see the increases that are required. However, through the COVID situation and indeed the safety and regular maintenance, this, this is necessitated in what's being put forward today. I would pick up on some of the other comments though and echo back to my announcements where I hope every single councillor who has spoken or who has residents that regularly use that bridge will throw their full weight and support behind ensuring that the petition really gets traction and literally hundreds of thousands of people across Plymouth and Cornwall and the commutable area actually take a few minutes just to put their name against the petition because as we all know people power is incredibly important it's people who elect us and in the numbers and we're here to represent them so speaking in this chamber about the concerns of cost of living how the government should put should support us in line with other locations throughout the country is clearly very important so what i would hope is everybody puts their passion and energy that when the petition is launched you yourself sign it you get your communities to sign it and what that will enable us to do as a local authority a joint committee with the Tamar Bridge is present that to the government that the people of Plymouth and Cornwall in the southwest want parity and a better funding formula. It is complicated and the more I've looked into it the Tamar Bridge and the Tor Point Ferry are two very different entities that while serving a combined residents there are distinct differences between the clientele of both and what we must ensure is that no one area becomes an outlier or it's very costly to try to live there that is not what this is about so i hope that you will see that this administration through its commitment number 55 is actually putting words into action to ensure that the people can speak we represent the people of this locality and if they want to put their pen to paper and support us in our challenge to the government to give us a better deal, then I hope everybody can join it and I'd look forward to being able to be back in this chamber to support some positive updates in the future. Clearly this issue has been a long-standing one, but for once we are actually taking a very proactive stance to try to get a proper solution once and for all. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Are there any further speakers? Uh, Councillor Pat Patel, would you Thank like you, to uh, speak now? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, we, we are unfortunate here that we have a unique uh, Tamar Bridge Act uh, just for us, uh, where we have a system whereby the user pays for the maintenance and everything else. The other two bridges, the, one, the, the fourth bridge and, and the seven bridge, are actually subsidised by the devolved administrations uh, in, in Scotland and in Wales. Uh, the, the decision to actually increase the toll and, and, and to make the recommendation to increase the toll was taken very reluctantly by the Tamar Bridge and Tor Point Ferry Committees. And we looked at all options uh, and, and before coming up with this recommendation that we have today. However, I must say that we are increasing pressure through both the Ferry Committee, uh, Bridge and the Ferry Committee, and also the local councils in both Cornwall and Plymouth on the government by lobbying uh, to have the Act amended. Thank you. Councillor Dream, would you like to sum up now? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'd just like to thank everybody for taking part, that's taken part in it today. Um, I was just going to read out the recommendations that's on page 31, just so that there's anyone joining us 
um, audio may not be able to see it. So the recommendation, Lord Mayor, uh, and reasoning is that the City Council, number one, agrees the Tamar Bridge and Torpoint Ferry Joint Committee's preferred option for a toll revision of uniform 30% toll increase on both the TAG and cash tolls for all users in the class is to be approved. Such approval to be subject to the Joint Committee making a decision whether or not to implement the preferred option following consideration of the public consultation process. The Joint Committee be given the authority to make the and implement any decisions. Number two, through the portfolio holders and joint chairs of the Tamar Bridge and Tallpoint Ferry Joint Committee, continue to lobby government and support a user's campaign for a fair contribution towards maintaining the A38 across the Tamar Bridge to reduce the burden on the user. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dreen. My advisor will now take a recorded vote. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, the same procedure as before, members. Um, for, against or abstain, please. Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. For. Councillor Bingley. For. Councillor Mrs Bridgman. For. Councillor Dr Buchan. For. Sorry. For. For. Thank you. Councillor Carlisle. For. Councillor Churchill. For. Councillor Coker. For. Councillor Collins. For. Councillor Corvid. For. Councillor Cresswell. For. Councillor Dan. For. Councillor Derrick. For. Councillor Downey. For. Councillor Dream. For. Councillor Evans. For. Councillor Gosling. For. Councillor Harrison. For. Councillor Hendy. For. Councillor Hume. Abstain. Councillor James. For. Councillor Jordan. For. Councillor Kelly. For. Councillor Lang. For. Councillor Loveridge. For. Councillor Dr Mahoney. For. Councillor Macdonald. For. Councillor Murphy. For. Councillor Neil. Abstain. Councillor Nicholson. For. Councillor Partridge. For. Councillor Patel. For. Councillor Penberthy. For. Councillor Mrs Pengelly. For. Councillor Rennie. For. Councillor Riley. For. Councillor Salmon. For. Councillor Singh. For. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakeham. Four. Councillor Ms. Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Lord Mayor. You're not voting. That motion is carried, 44, and three abstentions. Right, move to it. item nine on the agenda, the Tamar Bridge and Tall Point Ferry 2022-2023 revenue and capital estimates. Councillor Dream, would you like to introduce this report? Thank you, Lord Mayor. The revenue and estimates and capital programme report presents the budgets needed to deliver the current level of safety and reliability day to day and also undertake essential projects to optimise the service levels of the bridge and the ferries. They are based on the approval of a 30% toll increase that has recently but reluctantly been looked at, recommended in the earlier report just now. Without approval of these budgets, service delivery and the serviceable lives of the assets could be compromised. 
current practices for financing of the capital projects through the advanced funding from Cornwall Council in effect borrowing. This spreads the effect on the revenue budget and therefore the level of reserves held by the joint committee. The financing costs for the capital programme are reflected within the revenue estimates and include improved terms for new borrowing. Some of the projects to share with you looking, which are on page 73, the ferry traffic control system deferred from 2021 to 2022, bridge LED light street lighting deferred from 2021 to 2022, bridge access improvement works phase two, the main cable remedial works, future programs commencing in 22-23, supplementary cable works, the rocker and the pendle remedial works, ferry gantry tower replacement. The remaining items in the future capital programmes are scheduled to commence in the 23-24 period onwards are the bridge protective coating, phase three, and the ferry refits on the 2023 to 2025 cycle. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dream. Councillor Pat Patel, I understand you're seconding this report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? I reserve the right, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak on this item? Councillor Mark Coker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We on this side fully support the recommendations from the Torpoint and Tamar Bridge Committee. This allows the management of the bridge to maintain a safe environment for users to be able to improve assets as we go forward. And also it, may, it gives us the opportunity to maintain the strategic asset whilst looking for future funding. L Lord Mayor, we, we support from this side of the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Coker. Are there any other contributors? Councillor Pat Patel, would you like to um, say a few words? Nothing further to add. Lord Thank Mayor. you. Councillor Jonathan Drink, can I ask you to sum up, please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I welcome the, the opposition's support on this. Um, we do work cross-party on the committee, and um, I think that everything's been said that needs to be said. Um, again, I'll just read out the recommendations in case anyone's joining us virtually and doesn't know what they are. So the recommendation and reasons are that Plymouth City Council, number one, agree the Tamar Bridge and Torpoint Ferry Joint Committee Annual Business Plan and the 2022-23 Revenue Estimates and Capital Programme. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dreen. My advisor will now take a recorded vote. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Same procedure as before, members. I'll start with Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs Bridgman. Councillor Dr. Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Churchill. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corvid. Four. Councillor Creswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Goslin. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Lang. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Dr Mahoney. Four. Councillor MacDonald. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neal. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Partridge. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Councillor Penberthy. Four. Councillor Mrs. Pengelly. Four. Councillor Rennie. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Singh. Four. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakeham. Four. Councillor Ms. Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Lord Mayor, you're abstaining. Mm -hmm. That's carried. 47-4-1. That motion is carried. 
47 4 and one abstention. Thank you. Um, we move on to item 10 on the agenda, Climate Emergency Action Plan 2022. Councillor Bridgman, would you like to introduce this report? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I'm delighted to move the recommendation that we support and endorse the 2022 Climate Emergency Action Plan. The first thing I want to emphasise is that this administration has kept faith with the overall strategic approach that was put in place on the back of the Climate Emergency Declaration unanimously agreed at full council on the 18th of March 2019. I would also like to make the point that climate emergency should not be about politics. It is about life, the future, our planet. One thing we do particularly well in Plymouth on the big projects is we work cross-party. Therefore, from the outset, I stated that I am committed to working on climate issues on a cross-party basis. And so I am very pleased that the recommendation today will be seconded by Councillor Sudan. I'd also like to thank Councillor Bingley and his scrutiny committee for their consideration of the draft 2022 Climate Emergency Action Plan. I can confirm that the four recommendations made by the scrutiny committee were agreed at Cabinet earlier this month and have been incorporated into the report before us today. Lord Mayor. We have kept focus on this plan on those sectors that are responsible for the majority of carbon emissions. We've also kept the focus on deliverable actions and we've kept the focus on the collaborative working that was called for in the March 2019 Climate Emergency Declaration. Despite the pandemic, we have achieved a huge amount in the last year. We have installed 185 EV chargers across the city supported the country's first electric commercial ferry, commenced energy efficiency measures in 300 homes across the city, completed numerous walking and cycling schemes, held a second successful climate challenge event, and what I am most proud of, appointed the first climate change ambassador, Dominique Farrow. The third action plan contains 114 specific deliverable actions let me just highlight a few for you. I'm particularly proud that we have been able to commit to the establishment of a climate emergency investment fund, which will help fund and support future initiatives with the most significant carbon reduction benefits. Obviously, this is subject to the setting of the overall budget in February, but I'm impress impressed upon the leader and the whole cabinet of the importance of the fund to drive forward our com commitments sorry, climate commitments, and I hope that this chamber can support that when it is presented as part of the budget. For the first time, we've included actions in the 2022 plan for our partners in the Plymouth Net Zero Partnership, including some from the University of Plymouth, Derriford Hospital and Marjoms. We continue to roll out our major capital projects with an increasing emphasis on what these can deliver to support the climate emergency. Principally, Amongst these is undoubtedly the Transforming Cities Fund, which will not only deliver further walking and cycling projects alongside bus and rail improvements, but the flagship mobility hub project. We are working with Plymouth Energy Community to bring forward a huge solar array at Chelsea Meadow and continuing our work on low carbon heat networks, which are focused in the city centre, Mill Bay and Barn Barton. Last year, the government published Net Zero Strategy and the Transport Decarbonisation Plan. In light of this, we will review these to inform our thinking for climate actions in future plans. And lastly, we will continue to maximise funding opportunities to support the commitments in this plan. And we have concluded a number of actions to achieve this, Lord Mayor. The most recent analysis shows that 2016, there has been a decrease of 137 thousand tonnes of CO2 in the city. That is good progress, but we need to accelerate our work, especially in 2023, 24 and 25, if we are to meet 2030 net zero ambitions. And what we all 
and what we all committed to when we agreed the Climate Emergency Declaration. While those reductions are positive and clearly show us travelling in the right direction, there is still a lot more to do on our journey to meet net zero. We know full well that there are still many challenges ahead to achieve the scale of ambition we set out for ourselves to achieve net zero by 2030. We know, for instance, that we can't leave anyone behind on this journey, and we need to do more to engage partners and local communities. And I've just heard the beeper. Can you I am very that, proud please? to have led the climate emergency work in the last year, and I'm grateful for the support of my cabinet colleagues who have given this their respective areas. I therefore move the recommendation that the 2022 Climate Emergency Action Plan is supported and endorsed. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bridgman. Councillor Sudan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm delighted to second the recommendation on the 2022 Climate Emergency Action Plan, which was supported by all members of the Brexit Infrastructure and Legislative Change Overview and Scrutiny Committee, who put forward proposals that have been accepted today. It's also really good that we have still got a cross-party approach on the 2022 plan, and I hope we continue to work collaboratively like this in future action plans. Lord Mayor, we've all seen the devastating impacts that we have on, in our planet at the moment. When I presented the 2021 action plan to this meeting, on one, one of the hottest years on Earth since 1850 have occurred after 1998, with the last seven years being the hottest on record, We've seen devastating floods around the world and some here at home in Plymouth. We've also seen wildfires destroying homes and communities. And we've seen the decimation of the natural world and unprecedented biodiversity loss, which is why I was so pleased that at the last City Council, we declared an ecological crisis which runs in line with the climate crisis. The scientific evidence has been overwhelming for a long time. And it's good to see that the 2022 Action Plan continues to focus strongly on delivery so that we can make those meaningful reductions that Councillor Bridgman talked about in the carbon emissions. But we're in the transition phase and we're just about to move next year into the acceleration phase. So we really do have to step up to the plate now and drive forward many projects and initiatives that will result in more and greater reduction of carbon emissions. So um, I welcome the creation of the Climate Emergency Investment Fund, and it's now going to take really strong political leadership across the council to make sure that we allocate the funding to it. As, you keep, as we keep saying, we cannot afford not to do anything. And we have to keep, continue to bid for external funding, because there is a reality here where existing budgets within the council are going to have to be aligned to be able to achieve our net zero ambitions, and the government, too, has got to step up to the plate and do a lot more resourcing. Um, so we're in the transitional phase. We're about to move into the acceleration phase. So what does this mean? So hopefully in the plans, either this year and next year, we'll be taking decisions to ramp up delivery of projects that deliver significant carbon reductions, especially around building retrofits, energy generation of infrastructure and mobility infrastructure, because they will have the most impact. We should also, by next year, be laying out a clean scenario, a clear scenario, which will actually show how Plymouth is going to get to net zero by 2030. We need to continue embedding new ways of working, including behavioural change initiatives. This will be a real challenge now as we come out of COVID and we get back to work. How can we get back to work in a sustainable way? And we need to continue to lobby government for us so that we can have the powers and the resources to deliver net zero. Everyone has got a part to play. I appreciate the impacts of the pandemic have had some um, negative impact on our ability to hold proper climate conversations across the city, but it is important that we do. We have to engage with more key stakeholders, especially in local government and community groups. So I am welcoming the continuing commitment to the climate conversations, but we need to show that we are more proactive, and I really look forward to having an updated website where people can access to see what we're doing and also be able to put forward their plans and ideas. It's really important because local people are going to be key to the behavioural change that we need across the city. So I suppose this is where I can get political. 
I welcome the commitment to continue to lobby government and note that there are specific actions to respond to COP26, the government's net zero strategy and the transport decarbonisation plan. Whilst there are some positive developments on the government's response to the Housing, Communities and Local Government Select Committee report mentioned by Councillor Bridgman, especially in the role of the planning system, other comments are not so good. And I really hope that in my mind that we get more support from the government to resource local government to deliver decarbonation, which is what we need. The government's own committee on climate change said that if we can actually resource and give the innovation to local authorities, we will make much, much quicker reduction in our carbon commitment, our carbon footprint as we move forwards. I know resources are a challenge, but I've said before, we must always remember that the costs of inaction will be far higher and will disproportionately impact on the most vulnerable communities in our city. So in conclusion, Lord Mayor, by agreeing the 2022 Climate Emergency Action Plan today, everyone in this chamber can say with honesty that we are doing our bit. As I said back in 2019, the can, time for slow incremental up, change though. is over. Thank you. If we fail to meet the 2030 target, future generations will never, ever forgive us. So, Lord Mayor, I formally second the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dunn. Councillor Vivian Pengelly. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would like to support the recommendation on the 2022 Climate Emergency Action Plan. Decarbonising old and new housing will be key to achieving net zero by 2030. At our Cabinet meeting on the 10th of August last year, I announced a six-fold increase in funding for our Eco Homes programme to 1.5 million. Working in partnership with Plymouth Energy Community, we have secured planning permission for 70 zero-carbon homes at King's Tamerton. We have also secured planning permission for 10 family homes at the former Morley Youth Centre site in Plymstock. These low-carbon homes will be built to what we are calling the Plymouth Homes Standard, which exceeds building regulations and which are designed to create homes that are livable, adaptable and sustainable. We hope to break ground on both these sites later this year. I am pleased to see that we are committing in this action plan to hold another Plymouth Climate Challenge event this year. Not only is the Plymouth Climate Challenge raising awareness of the climate emergency and the role our communities can play in tackling climate change, but it also raising awareness of the other funding available through crowdfunding and the City Change Fund, including the Climate Emergency Bonus. I am also pleased to see that we are continuing to roll out retrofitting work in over 300 vulnerable homes across the city. There is a lot more we can be doing on housing and clearly government has a key role to play, but we are working with Homes England and the Department for Leveling Up, so I hope I will be able to say more on this later in the year. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pengelly. Councillor Wheeler. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I shall be supporting the motion today. Um, I think uh, we're doing quite well in terms of uh, the, uh, our uh, climate uh, change uh, commitment. Um, I have concerns about uh, several issues, Lord Mayor. Uh, the first is how are we going to measure our effectiveness? Um, there was a question earlier in the, uh, in the council meeting about uh, uh, measurement of our effectiveness and uh, I had also asked a question of Councillor Bridgman uh, a week or so ago about um, how we're going to do this and in both cases uh, she's given uh, uh, comments uh, about using the greenhouse gas protocol. Um, uh, can I incidentally thank uh, Councillor Bridgman for the very full answer she gave to me. Um, for 
some years now, since 2005, the government has compiled statistics on uh, the carbon dioxide emissions of all local authority and regional uh, areas in, in the country. Uh, they're currently published by the Department for Business, Energy and in Industrial Strategy, and uh, uh, they've been uh, previously uh, compiled by the, uh, the predecessors of that department. It hasn't always been the same, uh, the same department. Um, that would, if, if we used that measure, uh, that's a well understood, well, I say well understood, the results are well understood. I have no idea how they compile the statistics. I think that's a, a, very, uh, a very complicated uh, matter. But uh, we have to supply information to get that done, and it's done uh, by uh, 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 assessors independent of the council. Uh, so, uh, so it would cost us nothing, and we have an independent evaluation. But instead, we seem to be looking at uh, using the greenhouse gas protocol. We're going to have to compile our own statistics. We're going to have to pay. We're going to have to pay someone to do that, or do, the, do it ourselves. And when we're doing it ourselves, I think there might be a degree of suspicion. Why are we not using the government statistics? which are uh, well, uh, well, well tried. Um, do we have something to hide? I think that's a question that, uh, that the council is going to have to answer if we don't rely on the existing measures that are available to us. So I think that that's something that the council needs to think about very, very carefully. Um, I had a couple of other fairly small issues, but both uh, relevant to, uh, to the ward I, I, I represent. There's uh, an assessment in, uh, uh, on page 138, paragraph 3.667, refers to an assessment of the feasibility of heat networks in Barnbarton and Derriford. Uh, what a pity we're only starting to assess the, uh, the heat uh, heat networks in Barnbarton after planning approval has been granted to two uh, very large uh, developments in the area. Uh, the, the, two, um, the two estates well, most well, on closely... A on, a point of order, on a point of order, if Councillor Wheeler talks about the incinerator, I need to declare an interest as an employee of Babcock and therefore a beneficiary of the power from the incinerator. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Noted. Uh, Lord Mayor, I wasn't going to mention the incinerator, but obviously the heat network would be dependent on heat provided by the incinerator. So in that case, I apologise for not, uh, not uh, mentioning it too earlier. Um, but uh, it, it's far too late to assess the needs of Barn Barton when the planning uh, permissions have been given and work has to be commenced in the next year. Uh, it will cost something like 100 times the, what it would cost to retrofit uh, heat, uh, heat networks in, in uh, pavements and, uh, and buildings, and it will not be practical. So I, I'm bitterly uh, disappointed at the, uh, the failure of the council. Uh, that's successive uh, leaderships, uh, not just the current one, but previous as well, Barn Barton has been let down very badly in the way that the uh, uh, that it has been that the uh, uh, assessment of uh, the heat networks uh, have, have been ignored. Devonport has been well served, but not Barn Barton. The other point, if I still have time, is to refer to the uh, development in Kings Tamerton, uh, an excellent development by Peck, but in completely the wrong place. Uh, why? Why, do we, why does Peck want to build on the last green open space available to the public in Kings Tamerton? I don't think the council would be selling the last open space it owned to a developer in any other ward. I think uh, St. Budo in this case is, is being treated very badly there. Uh, the, the site is being sold for a pound. Lord Mayor, I would give Your time's up, Councillor Wheeler. Thank you. I think I've made my point. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Dr Pam Buckham. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as Vice Chair of the Brexit Infrastructure and Legislative Change Overview and Scrutiny Committee, I was pleased to be able to scrutinise this report and to present the recommendations of the Scrutiny Committee to Cabinet. 
I thank Councillor Bridgman and the Cabinet for accepting those recommendations and will look forward to seeing them fully implemented. I'm pleased to see the current administration is continuing with the plan laid out by Labour when we brought forward the Climate Emergency Declaration in 2019. As we move into the transition phase of the climate emergency response, it's extremely important that we become equipped for carbon accounting, as has been mentioned twice so far today, um, both within the Council and supporting other organisations in their endeavours. It's also absolutely crucial that the Council brings together its commitments to respond to the climate crisis and to provide ecological and ocean recovery. Having only passed the Labour proposed motions on ecological and ocean recovery in November of last year, it would be unfair to expect these commitments to have yet been embedded into the Climate Emergency Action Plan. However, I'd like to take this opportunity, Lord Mayor, to remind the Council of those commitments. The climate emergency response has been embedded into Council decision making with an expectation that all decisions consider the potential impact on carbon emissions. For next year's plan, we will expect to see this extended to accommodate impacts on ecosystems, food and water availability, human health, and driving progress towards ocean recovery. There must be built into the local plan through processes of revision and supplementary plans to ensure that the council is transparently accountable. One of the most important elements of the Climate Emergency Action Plan is the focus on community engagement and responsibility, in other words, environmental citizenship. The plan for this year lacks sufficient progress in bringing communities with us, and this prompted the scrutiny recommendation to create a website portal to enable residents and organisations to access resources to help them respond to the climate emergency. This aligns closely with Pledge 6 of the Motion for the Ocean, and a portal which responds to both marine and land-based actions for climate and ecology has the potential to be very effective. But in the transition period of the climate emergency response, we must ramp up our engagement work because the Council cannot fulfil its net zero commitment without the whole city also working towards this goal. I urge all Council members to give particular focus to this strand of action in next year's plan. Next year's plan must give more emphasis to partnership working and embed actions to develop ocean literacy and marine citizenship and provide physical and digital experiences of marine and terrestrial nature. Positive experiences of nature help people develop a dependency upon nature and when people need nature they become motivated to protect it as marine and environmental citizens. In November, the Council committed to developing a sustainable and equitable blue economy through the National Marine Park and wider Council actions, and that all Council decisions relating to climate and ecology will have a net positive impact on local communities. Fairness and equality must underpin our decision making to ensure that we don't address environmental issues at the expense of marginalised or deprived people. I trust council members will welcome this reminder of how our climate, ocean and ecological commitments align and will agree that it's common sense to bring these commitments together in our decision-making processes and actions. I'm pleased to be able to support the council's climate emergency action plan for the coming year. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Buckham. Uh, Councillor Mark Coker. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Um, I fully support the, this latest version. Um, I listened to Councillor Dream's announcements earlier today that all came from the Transforming Cities Fund that was won under this Labour administration. I think it's important that we continue to work together to ensure that all the TCF schemes are delivered on time. The Mobility Hubs was a specialist um, uh, project that Councillor Dan and I worked so extremely hard um, two years ago to get that included in the TCF. I think once this money has gone, Councillor Bridgman, and it has been spent, we're, we're looking at the brochure and seeing all the things that have come from that the uh, Broxton Drive, Stoke Damerel, Southway, um, really great projects. But if we look a couple of years ahead, when both the emergency walking and cycling money and the TCF money has been spent, 
this has given Plymouth a huge legacy to move the climate and the carbon strategies forward. But there is real danger here that if the central government doesn't continue with the funding that these two plans and our climate emergency need, uh, we, we need to look at how we're going to future fund because otherwise all that work that we've done on mobility, on uh, improving, um, improving walking, cycling, um, working with our bus companies will all come to an end. And I really worry that at the moment there is no strategy and no funding coming out of central government. There was, but we need to be pushing for a long-term solution and one-off funding bids is not the answer. We need a 10-year program of funding to move this agenda forward. But saying that, I do fully support where we're going with these two plans. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Coker. Councillor Chas Singh. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. I just wanted to say I fully support this motion brought forward by Councillor Maddie Bridgman and the cross-party support. Um, climate change is everybody's business. It's not a political football that we can sit here and make decisions for future generations who will decide as to the actions that we take today is what they will inherit tomorrow. So I fully support this. I hope in years to come, 2030 will spring upon us out of the blue just like that. And we'll be looking at each other and saying, what did you do? That's if we're still here, um, for those who are going to be here. Um, but more importantly, is making sure, and totally agree with Councillor Mark Coker and his commitment, and his comment, sorry, in regards to a long-term strategy, because this isn't a five-minute thing. If we're fast-forwarding to the next seven years, 2030, as a council and an authority um, and people in position, we have to make sure that the funding is going to be there for us to make those points and raise those cases and have a longer, longer term commitment to the future of this city, the people and the citizens. So um, well done on bringing that motion forward. The third one in response to the climate emergency plan in, uh, back in March 2019, um, fully support it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Councillor Richard Bingley. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And um, I just want to sort of follow in the vein of Councillor Buchan, who's been Vice Chair of the Brexit Infrastructure and Legislative Change Committee. We, we examined this over the last uh, nine months now. Councillor Sudan also on the committee, uh, Councillor Coker. And we, we've got really good cross-party work going. Uh, at times it was a little bit fraught, but um, you know, these are very, very significant issues. If, if there's some learning from it, um, I, I'm really pleased. There seems to be, as we talk, I don't know how the vote will go, but there seems to be a consensus that we've got the, really the right direction of travel. And I, I'd like to thank both Councillor Bridgman for her leadership in that over the past year, and Councillor Dan, who, who laid the foundations. Um, I, I think the report that was presented to us uh, was very, very professional, it was slick. I did sneak some looks and views at other authorities' climate action plans that were a little bit kind of much, well, much more, um, I would say, granular, if you like, not as engaging for the public. So I, I think the challenge moving forward, actually, we, we've got all these fantastic plans written down now, uh, and we need to sort of add, add to them. There's two things, really, uh, to hold the sort of political cooperation. I, I, I think it it's doesn't need to be said that over the next 10 years, central government, whatever the party colour, will completely support this if we come up with good plans and good local action plans. Um, but we've got to make sure that they're realistic, uh, and, and these indeed are. But I think where we've got it right, and maybe others around the country have got it a little bit wrong, is, is that we've got the balance between keeping a competitive city a very attractive city to invest in and live in, but at the same time, we're not going down the route of putting in place quite punitive 
um, sort of green taxes, etc. And we've really got to watch that pushing forward because we won't hold political consensus if we go in that direction. Um, finally, a really good point was made about public relations and the website. Um, let's get the plan out there. It looks very, very good so far as read, we read it, but this is all about training and awareness. Um, you know, a lot of us are kind of into this, and I can see Councillor Bridgman's got very, very into this over the last few years. You know, it's a fascinating topic for some of us. But out there, among 262,000 residents of Plymouth, they've got to see, especially when there's sort of a cost of living crisis coming, they've got to see the value in, in what we're agreeing here and what we've planned and what our plans are. Uh, and, and I think that's sort of the, for the direction of travel pushing forward, it's about community engagement as much as it is about us getting our plans right internally. But thanks to everyone for their input during the year on the committee cycle. It's been very, very good to support it and, and work with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bingley. Um, Councillor Maddy Bridgman, to sum up, please. Pemberthy's got his hand up. Oh, sorry, Councillor Pemberthy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think it's a stunning fact that 31% of all of Plymouth's carbon emissions come from buildings. And that's something that matters to each of us because each of us live in a building. So I'm pleased that the direction of travel in terms of housing continues and welcome P Councillor Pengeli's comments on, on taking this forward. This is the last year of transition from planning into really full-on activity in the plan. And I'd just like to make some observations about what that means for next year as I support this year's tra last transitional plan. And I agree with Councillor Bridgman that we need to see substantial acceleration in delivery in the next plan. It's great to see some retrofits, but 300 is a, bare, a mere start. It's a drop in the ocean. There are far more homes in Plymouth that need retrofits than 300 a year. If we only do 300 a year between now and the end of the decade, we will have missed out and we won't hit our targets. So what are we going to do about retrofits that will not only reduce carbon emissions, but also cut back on utility costs? And as utility costs go up, that's going to be really important in ensuring people don't go into fuel poverty and tackle those who are already living in it. <coughs> so what can we do to support homeowners? What pressures can we bring to bring on our social landlords? And how can we work more with private landlords so that 300 a year gets multiplied by a substantial amount? I'm pleased to see that the Council's Broadland Gardens low carbon scheme and the Pet Homes zero carbon scheme for Kim's Tamerton have both been granted permissions. But these should be the norm for all planning permissions. Every home built in the city should be at least low carbon and preferably zero carbon from now on in. So what are we going to do between now and next year to help that happen? So we need to see more. We need to see what more strings we can bring to bear. We need to encourage every homeowner and developer in Plymouth to do more because we need to tackle that 31% in buildings. And just as a little final thought, I'm really pleased that PEC Renewables building from rooftop solar to Ernie out to Saltram, a real trajectory of success for that initiative that I started in 2012 as a new cabinet member. And I know Councillor Dan underwrote the Saltram grid connection, which is why we've got that one off the line. But what's the next one? It takes time to plan these things, so let's start looking now for what the next one is, in order that we can, in the city, generate the power we need from renewable sources, rather than having to get them from those sources that create carbon. So while welcoming this, I'd like to see next year's plan with a lot more accelerated action in it, in order that we hit the 2030 target we've set, rather than the 2050 target that would be disastrous to the country that is sort of nationally recognised. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pemberthy. Councillor Nick Kelly. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, it's clearly evident that this uh, report has hit home. It, is, it isn't political, and it's, I'm delighted that it's got such strong support. Um, I've got the honour and privilege as leader of Plymouth City Council to go 
and engage with many of the local businesses across our city, both uh, independent small businesses and indeed large multinational institutions. And it's one thing that I always discuss is, you know, what are you doing to reduce your carbon footprint? And I think what I would like to just do here formally is thank the many, many organisations that have really embraced what we as a city council want for our city and are clearly leading the way in many fields. And it would be wrong to highlight anyone in particular, but I'm just going to break that uh, rule. For example, the University of Mark and John have got a very, very powerful proposition. Um, we've spoken about measuring and monitoring. If you go on their website, if you look at what they've got, they have really mapped out exactly what their intentions are, where they are right here, right now, and where they want to be. Equally, there's a company called Red Rock at the other extreme that's very small. You can go on there and they will tell you how much carbon they've saved and what they're doing to save it. So that's just two very small examples. Clearly, we've got Babcock, we've got Princess Yachts, other main um, organizations and large employers in the city. And every single one of those organizations is putting a great deal of resource, thought and effort to ensure that their credentials, when we look in the mirror in 2030, they can clearly say, we took the leap of faith, we took action, we've invested, and we are moving in the right direction. 2030 is a very, very ambitious deadline. It's been highlighted here today that Plymouth City Council and indeed the City of Plymouth cannot do it alone. It's actually not even a governmental issue. It's a global issue that everybody seriously needs to look at how they can reduce and what we can do to ensure that there's better sustainability and it has less impact. But I would just like to pay tribute to all those organisations that we haven't necessarily flagged up here, but there are some absolute trailblazers in this city with regards to the climate emergency and the actions being taken. And I think the one thing that I would ask and the one thing that I would look to try to do with this administration is make sure that we champion those because clearly those that have led and done the research, it's easier to follow and copy than trying to keep reinventing what you need to do, especially for smaller businesses and uh, households. So absolutely, this is a vital, a vital day today. I'd like to thank all the contributions from previous members and councillors to get to the point that we've got and uh, obviously there's a high amount of work and effort that still needs to go into this as well as financial resources too. Thank you my Lord Mayor. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Lovely. Um, Councillor Maddie Bridgman would you like to sum up please? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll try and address a couple of the points that were made as well. Um, Councillor Wheeler, in my speech, I did mention Barn Barton specifically, and this area is an area of focus moving forward. But I will raise your points with officers about measuring effectiveness as well, because I did want this plan specifically to be measurable. I wanted us to actually tick off the actions. Um, Councillor Buckham, um, the website portal, we have made a start on that, I'm so excited. But it has to be user friendly. We have to share best practice. I want it visual I want anyone to go in there I want it easily located rather than put it in a search engine so it's got to it's got to be good um, but it is actually as, as Councillor Kelly has stated I want to share a lot of the case studies and the best practice from other organizations because we can all do this together we really can um, Councillor Coker the reason obviously we agree to set up the climate emergency investment fund once that's in place um, hopefully that will go through budget um, next month once that's in place we can bid for more funding we can top it up as and well so hopefully that that is, is really going to play a huge part um, Councillor Blingley yes other councils my goodness have I read some cumbersome dreadful documents I wanted this to be concise I wanted this to be the sort of document that people don't groan when they open it up they look at it, they like it, they read the case studies and think, actually, I could do that. I could use that in my home, I could use that in my business, however big or small it was. So this is why this is smaller. And also, 57 councillors in this room probably all received this on their doorsteps. So if this had been bigger, that's even more trees were cutting down and more paper. So I wanted it concise, I wanted people to pick it up and enjoy reading it. So absolutely. Um, also, yeah, more engaging, so it's easier to read um, and less print. Um, and this plan actually is measurable for the first time, which I'm really pleased about. Um, I've noted the comments from Councillor Singh. Um, I think all I have to say now is that we now have a really robust plan, and I'm so pleased to hear the comments from everyone here today. And we are able now to progress to the next phase. 
And it's a plaid that I, I'm very, very proud of. And I cannot stay, you know, thank you to Councillor Dan and to Paul Barnard and his amazing team of four, just four people. And they've worked so hard on this. They're absolutely incredible. So lastly, I'd just like to say, if we can please support the four recommendations that are actually located on page 109 of your packs. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Right, we now move into the vote. My advisor will take the vote. Uh, thank you, members. And just to report, the last vote we took for Tamar Bridge was 46-4 uh, and one abstention. Just so you're all aware, I double counted someone, so apologies for that. But we'll move on quickly. If you could respond for, against or abstain, Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Churchill. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corvid. Four. Councillor Creswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Goslin. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Councillor Lang. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Dr Mahoney. Four. Councillor MacDonald. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neal. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Partridge. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Councillor Pemberthy. Four. Councillor Pen Mrs. Pengelly. Four. Councillor Rennie. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Singh. Four. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakeham. Four. Councillor Ms. Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Can Lord Mayor, abstain. abstain. This motion is carried 46 4 and one abstention. Right, we're now going to go to a break for half an hour because um, I'm freezing um, and I know Councillor Aspinall will be in desperate need of a hot drink now. 16.45, councillors, thank you.
Members, please rise. Um, can I thank members of the council for their support with the, my charities today and the cakes. I hope you enjoyed the cakes that were on offer today. A lot of them made by residents and colleagues. So thank you for supporting me today. Right, we're going to press on now with item 11 on the agenda. The Corporate Carbon Reduction Plan 2022 and Councillor Maddie Bridgman, would you like to introduce this report? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Plymouth City Council delivers a range of services to local people and business in the city. In doing so, we are responsible for generating 1% of the total carbon emissions in the city. 
The March 2019 Climate Emergency Declaration committed us to reducing our emissions as a Council to net zero. We have therefore produced the Corporate Carbon Reduction Plan, which sets out nine areas of focus for us to do, for us to do this. Again, I would like to thank Councillor Bingley and his scrutiny committee again for their endorsement of the 2022 plan. We have achieved a lot in the last year despite the impacts of the pandemic. We updated the Council's corporate plan to reflect the climate emergency declaration and we have secured £5 million from the Public Sector Decarbonisation Fund to install heat pumps in a number of our buildings and secured £36,500 from the National Heat Network Delivery Unit towards District Energy. We have put LEDs in the Life Centre, purchased seven vehicles with electric lifts and completed an ish initial e-learning climate change training programme for staff and councillors. In relation to the City Council's, Council's own carbon emissions, we have created a City Council carbon emissions framework to create our own bespoke data set for our future corporate carbon reduction reporting. The most up-to-date data from 2020 shows that there was a decrease in building, street furniture and travel emissions, but there was an increase in emissions from our fleet due to the impact of COVID-19. Overall, we have estimated that we have seen a reduction of nearly 850 tonnes of CO2 compared to 2019. The 2022 Corporate Carbon Reduction Plan contains 35 specific actions for what we will do as a City Council to reduce our emissions. This year, I have streamlined the plan further and included 12 top tips for how staff can do their bit to tackle climate change. Most notable actions include developing a rolling five-year plan to address our retained council buildings, continuing to decarbonise our fleet with the ambition for all cars and vans to be electric by 2024, further decarbonising our street infrastructure and introducing a zero emissions travel incentive scheme. Once again, I'm very grateful to Councillor Dan for seconding this recommendation and I formally move, Lord Mayor. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Bridgman. Councillor Sudan, I understand you're a second with the report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Thank I'll you, Sue. Speak now. Thank you, Lord thank Mayor. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Lord Mayor. We're second, second in for second. I'm going to second the recommendation on the 2022 Corporate Carbon Reduction Plan. Um, although the City Council is only responsible for 1% of total emissions, it is important that we lead by example by making sure that we have our own house in order when it comes to carbon emissions. And it is really, really good to see that Councillor Bridgman has continued with the meetings that I started with her fellow Cabinet members on climate actions because every Cabinet member and every service director and department has to do its bit to reduce emissions too. And I also know that we've been doing some really good cross-party and cross-authority working as well, making sure that we're benchmarking our actions and bringing back good practice from other authorities. Um, although the plan was supported by all members at the Brexit Infrastructure and Legislative Change Overview and Scrutiny Committee at its meeting on the 8th of December, we had very limited time actually to look at the 35 actions that are in this plan as well as over 100 actions in the Climate Emergency Action Plan. So I am going to request that going forward, I do think we need to consider how scrutiny can play a much greater role in the development of the action plans to add real value to the process so it's not a tick box exercise. <clears throat> But this plan keeps faith with the approach of earlier plans that look into our council buildings, our council fleet and equipment, roads, street furniture, staff and councillor travel, and also looking at the waste we generate, because these really are important. And again, I'm looking forward to when the Plymouth Climate Hub comes online, because then we'll be able to show local people and local businesses what we've already done, what we're doing, and the carbon that we've already saved another way we can lead by example. 
Um, I'm also aware that senior managers of the council meet as the Climate Emergency Board, and I know that we've got our green champions on board. But I suppose this is where we now have to make a step change in what we do in our behaviours. Um, we are moving in from the transitional phase into the acceleration phase next year, which means we have to be better and quicker about what we're going to do. So, for instance, it's a lot easier to say we can remove single-use plastics from all our buildings. It also means that we have control over our infrastructure and our investments, and we can continue to plant thousands of trees across the city. But actually, some of the actions that are in here means that we have to do more. It is not up to, I don't know whether, um, Anthony Payne, if you're listening, it's not up to the director of place to make sure that the whole council follows through with this climate emergency actions. If you look at some of the actions in here, we should be looking at our procurement, where we procure our services from and our goods from. Are the people we're procuring from also following their climate emergency actions as well to make sure that we're getting good climate value for money? If you look in here, we are going through an accommodation strategy right now. We're going through a transformation strategy right now across all departments of the council. As we go through each phase of that, we should be making sure that we are looking at the impact on our carbon emissions. We have a real opportunity now to speed up what we're doing as a council. And I think just to add, especially as we all go back to work, as we start going back to work, are we really going to go back to when everybody has to turn up in an office and use carbon to get into work? Look at our hybrid ways of working and how best that can support the climate change agenda for the council. So I'm saying that everybody now should look at their actions and be able to decarbonise what they're doing. So Lord Mayor, I formally recommend this recommendation and in doing so reiterate that we on this side wish to work in collaboration on future climate plans as they come into the Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dan. Are there any other speakers on this? Councillor George Wheeler. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I shall be supporting this, uh, this motion. I think uh, the, uh, the corporate plan is, is good, it's well argued and, uh, and well presented. Um, my concern is about number four, staff and councillor travel to work plan. Um, councillor Dan referred to the need to make a step change. Well, I've made a step change in the last few years I always used to travel to uh, council meetings by public transport. Now I always travel by car. I don't think that's quite what the, car what the carbon reduction plan intends. Um, the problem is, if I want to get here on time, I can't rely on buses anymore. Public transport is now absolutely appalling in this city. Um, now, I realise that the pandemic has been a total disaster for, for public transport. Um, oh, and by the way, I think it would be very unfair of me to expect Councillor Bridgman to answer these points, so, but I think, I, I hope Councillor uh, Dreen might, uh, might be able to comment. Um, things were, th things had got worse before the, uh, the, the pandemic. Um, when I moved to St. Budo uh, 20 years ago, I had a five-minute bus service down Victoria Road. Um, it stayed that way for, for 10 years or so, but uh, I, I'm afraid it is after the sale of city bus. Frequency reduced uh, on both the 43 and the uh, 42 uh, A, B and C, uh, which were then renumbered 50 and 51 with another reduction in uh, frequency. And um, it was, it, it, I, I, anyone who wasn't really committed to using public transport would have used their car anyway. But uh, the pandemic made things worse. Now, uh, we have a chance to recover that position. Um, we have a, a, a £60 million pound bid uh, to the DFT uh, for a £3 billion pound, uh, pot. Unfortunately, the F Confederation for Passenger Transport estimates that that pot has been, the, the, the amount of bids for that pot amount to seven billion. So uh, the chances of our getting 60 million is, is I guess, is not too high. But um, the other problem there is that the present support runs out, as I understand, on the, 30, on the, uh, at the end of March. 
the new support kicks in on the 1st of April, but you have to register new services on, uh, and give 42 days notice, which brings us to uh, about mid-February for giving notice of those new services. How on earth are we going to do that when we don't know what support we've got at the time? Um, I, I, I think there is, and if we don't get this right, we have no chance at all of, uh, of, of getting our staff, certainly not our councillors, to move to, um, to, use, to using buses instead of driving. I, I wonder if anyone, any of us, did any of us drive, uh, come by public transport today? Um, I would be surprised, and I'd applaud anyone who did. But we need to get uh, public transport to a position whereby most of us want to use it. Not that we feel we have to, but we want to use it because it's good. It gets us where we want to go in time, and, uh, uh, and we don't have to bother with any parking problems or anything like that. Not that we have parking problems. So, Lord Mayor, I, I, I would welcome some information about from really Councillor Dreen on how we're going to achieve uh, corporate carbon plan uh, item four. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wheeler. Councillor John Riley. Thank you, more, Lord Mayor. I'd like to congratulate Councillor Bridgman on bringing forward the 2022 Corporate Carbon Reduction Plan. It has to be right that the Council of the Year does its bit to reduce its own emissions whilst continuing to deliver a wide range of services to local people. I believe this is something we all must commit to cross-party support going forward to ensure that it is achieved. Lord Mayor, I wanted to specifically highlight Action 363 sitting in my portfolio, which seeks to update our taxi licensing policy to encourage greener vehicles as we move towards ultra-low emission vehicles by the year 2030. We currently have a consultation on the new policy, which, as members would probably be aware, started on the 25th of November and runs through to the 17th of September. Uh, and there are a number of practicalities we need to address in decarbonising the taxi fleet. But other authorities, like Dundee, have done this or have started the journey. We are keen to work very closely with the taxi trade and take a phased approach in reaching this goal. But we have said very clearly, Lord Mayor, that this is the Council's aspiration that all hackney carriage and private IR vehicles will be required to be at least an ultra-low emission vehicle and, in an ideal world, all electric, and this will be kept under review. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Councillor Chas Singh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I was going to... I'm happy to support this motion uh, in front of us. Uh, some of the things I was going to say were said by the Cabinet member, Councillor Riley, in regards to the consultation, which is still open um, until the 17th of February. So um, it's an opportunity for those drivers and the public to be able to um, put their points across. Uh, so look forward to seeing what kind of response we do get back in regards to the decarbonisation of the vehicles uh, and ultra-low emission ultra-low emission vehicles by 2030. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Are there any more people who would like to speak? Councillor Mark Coker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I uh, fully support the document. I would just like to um, go one step uh, further to Councillor Wheeler. Um, having been really involved in public transport over the last uh, two years with the pandemic, I think the better bus strategy that's on its, on its way will help, but fundamentally, we've got to, how are we going to, or how are you going to engage with getting the people that have chosen not to use the bus services because of um, the pandemic, when you talk to the elderly or the um, disabled groups at the moment, there is a real distrust in the safeness of the buses. I don't agree with that, um, and I fully support our service, but have we thought about any ways that we can work with the bus companies, the train companies, to actually get people back 
because if we, if we, can, we could put on extra buses, we could reduce the, the fares, but if people do not have the trust in the, in the um, safeness, for a lack of a better word, of, of the transport systems, then we're going to set ourselves back 10 years. And I think that's a really important point as a public, uh, as a council, that we address. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Coker. Councillor Jonathan Dream. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat. Um, the bus service has had problems recently, as I've reported in previous council meetings, and I will be supporting this motion, by the way. Um, they, they have had staff shortages. They're also looking at new fleets coming forward. We have our own bus service improvement plan going forward. We, we speak to companies about commuting on um, sustainable transport for staff when their building applications come forward now. Um, it's a partnership work, this. We can't do this by ourselves. Um, we, we need partners to do this. We need to listen to each other. We need to look at very many different options on this. Um, but I would like to hope, working in partnership, we'll be able to some of these address, additions and also concerns that uh, Councillor Wheeler raised. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dream. Councillor Natalie Harrison. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, I will fully support the, uh, the, the motion, um, but I did want to um, query regarding uh, point 3.49 uh, when it talks about the improvement plan, bus service improvement plan, and consider the role of park and ride, existing park and ride facilities. And I wondered whether or not um, any consideration had been made already to linking the Koi Pool park and ride to the other existing park and ride uh, services at George Park and, and Ride and Central Park because at the moment the east of the city is uh, not well served by being able to link up and it means that perhaps uh, people are choosing to use their cars because they can't access Central Park easily or uh, you know, Derriford and move round and perhaps if there was a possibility of a, a round robin uh, to get all the way around the city on the park and ride, it might reduce some of the traffic from the eastern part of the city and um, move people away from their cars. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harrison. Is there any more speakers on this? Um, Councillor Maddie Bridgman, would you like to sum up? Sum up. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Dan is absolutely right. Obviously, we're transitioned to acceleration phase now. Um, and I wanted this plan, like the last one, to be concise. Um, just actually, when you open it up on page two of your plan, you've got little hints and tips. We can all do our bit. You know, we don't have to brush our teeth for hours with the tuck running. We can just do it, turn, turn it on to brush our brush at the end of it. Little, little tiny things make a big difference. I've noted Councillor Reeler's um, comments, and I'm absolutely chuffed to pieces that Councillor Coker and Councillor Dream have actually stolen the thunder and answered the questions for me. So thank you so much for those. Um, and, and Councillor Coker, you're absolutely right. It's about getting public confidence back in public transport again. Um, and Councillor Harrison, I've noted what you said, and I'll be discussing this with Councillor Dreen and officers. So I ask everybody if you could please support the recommendations on page 152 of your packs. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Thank you, Councillor Dan. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank, thank you, Councillor Bridgman. Um, we'll now move to the vote, and my advisor will take a recorded vote. So when your name's called out, can you vote for against or abstain. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll start with Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr Buckham. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Churchill. He is absent. Councillor Coker. Councillor Coker. Four. Thank you. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corbett. Four. Councillor Creswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Gosling. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hemby. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. 
Councillor Jordan. For. Councillor Kelly. For. Councillor Lang. For. Councillor Loveridge. For. Councillor Dr Mahoney. For. Councillor Macdonald. For. Councillor Murphy. For. Councillor Neil. For. Councillor Nicholson. For. Councillor Partridge. For. Councillor Patel. For. Councillor Pemberthy. For. Councillor Mrs Pengelly. For. Councillor Rennie. For. Councillor Riley. For. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Singh. For. Councillor Shea. For. Councillor Smith. For. Councillor Stevens. For. Councillor Stoneman. For. Councillor Tuffin. For. Councillor Wakeham. For. Councillor Ms. Watkin. For. Councillor Wheeler. For. Lord Mayor, are you abstaining? Right, that motion is carried, 45-4, uh, and I'm at one abstention. Thank you. Um, now we move on to item 12. The appointment of an external auditor. Councillor Nick Kelly, uh, would you like to introduce your report? Thank you, Lord Mayor. The purpose of this report is to ask mm -hmm. Council to approve the approach for appointing the Council's external auditors. This approach was endorsed by the Audit and Governance Committee on the 14th of January 2022. The existing contract for Plymouth External Auditor is currently with Grant Thornton and ends on the 31st of March 2023. All local authorities must appoint a new auditor, an external auditor, by the 31st of December 2022. And the Council has two options with regards to the appointment process. First option is to participate in the national procurement process, which is conducted by Public Sector Audit Appointments, or PSAA. Or the second option is to undertake its own procurement process. There are a number of risks undertaking a separate procurement process, and these include the inability to secure competitive bids, the limited and shrinking number of suppliers that are able to provide an external audit function, the additional resources required to undertake a procurement for an external audit contract, the requirement to set up an independent audit panel with responsibility for managing the procurement process, and the likelihood that the PSAA route will return lower costs to the Council because of the volume of work let to specific providers. The main advantage of taking part in the national procurement is the PSAA have experience in the appointment of external auditors, the PSAA have experience of managing external audit contracts, and the Council will save time and resources if PSAA manage the award process. A national procurement will offer value for money in the contract prices, and that's clearly important for this Council. If the Council wants to be part of the national scheme run by the PSAA, it must notify them of this decision by the 11th of March 2022. So based upon the reasons set out within the report, I recommend that Council accept the Public Sector Audit Appointments, PSAA, invitation to opt into the sector-led option for the appointment of external auditors to principal local government and police bodies for a financial uh, term of five years, commencing from the 1st of April, 2023. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kelly. Uh, Dr John, uh, John Mahoney, I understand you are seconding this report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I will second it. And just to say, this went through the Audit and Governance Committee for discussion earlier in the month, uh, and I'm very happy to support it. Thank you, Councillor Dr John Mahoney. Um, would anybody else like to speak on this particular item? Right, no. Councillor Kelly, would you like to sum up? It's a very brief sum up, my Lord Mayor. You've heard the reasons and the benefits of uh, going for the preferred recommendation, and I hope that all members can uh, do that for the reasons set out, no more so than the practicalities and value for money that this option offers for not only the Council, but of course the taxpayers too. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Right, we're going to move to the vote um, and we're going to do a recorded vote and my advisor will be calling out your names. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll start with Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corvid. Four. Councillor Creswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dreen. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Goslin. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Lang. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Councillor Loveridge. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Dr Mahoney. Four. Councillor MacDonald. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neil. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Partridge. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Councillor Pemberthy. Four. Councillor Mrs. Pengelly. Four. Councillor Rennie. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Salmon. Four. Councillor Singh. Four. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakem. Four. Councillor Ms. Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Lord Mayor, you want to say anything? No, no, well. Is that the five to one? Forty-five in favour, one abstention. The motion. Forty-five in favour, one abstention. The motion is carried. Right, we're moving to uh, item 13 on the agenda, um, Audit and Governance Committee Terms of Reference. Councillor Dr John Mahoney, uh, would you like to introduce this report? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. I would like to recommend approval of this item brought forward from the Audit and Governance Committee. It updates the Audit and Governance Terms of Reference to SIPFA standards and includes references to the Council's family of companies and, and the ethical framework. The remit of the Audit and Governance Committee is extensive, and these terms of reference refocus on other areas than the core functions, which are external and internal audit, risk management, fraud, treasury management, etc. The other areas include the constitution, councillor development, the ethical framework, civic issues, and electoral arrangements oversight. As part of focusing on these areas, whilst not diluting the attention from the core audit functions, a governance subcommittee is being set up to allow more consideration of these other matters. The chair will also produce an annual report on the work of the committee and periodically report to council and cabinet in order to try and raise the profile of this committee. Um, I move, therefore, that we um, approve adoption of the SIPFA model terms of reference outlined at Appendix 1, with the inclusion of the overview of the Council's family of companies, brackets 2.11, and the ethical framework, brackets 7. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Dr John Heine. Um, can I ask uh, Councillor John Riley, because I understand you are seconding this report, would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Yeah, I'd like to speak now, please, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, I would like to second uh, uh, this uh, proposal, and I think the committee is to be commended for uh, looking at an area of which they felt could uh, have a bit of improvement. Uh, they've taken the right steps, um, and uh, yeah, I think it's something we need to support today. So uh, I'd like to second and support this motion, Lord Mayor. 
Thank you, uh, Councillor Riley. Um, right, are there any other speakers on this one? That's great, we're going straight to the vote. Dr Mahoney, would you like to uh, sum up or would you like to go straight to the vote? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I think we can move straight to the vote. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're going straight to the vote. Um, my advisor will now take a recorded vote. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Allen. Support. Um, four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corvid. Four. Councillor Cresswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Goslin. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Lang. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Dr Mahoney. Four. Councillor Macdonald. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neal. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Partridge. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Councillor Pen uh, Penberthy. Four. Councillor Mrs Pengelly. Four. Councillor Rennie. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Singh. Four. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakem. Four. Councillor Ms Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. And your abstention, Lord Mayor. Um, that motion is carried, 45 to 1 abstention. Thank you, councillors. Um, we move on to item 14 of the agenda, um, and that is the Tamar Bridge and Tallpoint Ferry Joint Committee change to the terms of reference. Councillor Jonathan Dream, would you like to introduce your report? Thank you, Lord Mayor. An internal review of the Joint Committee's Terms of Reference arose from the Local Government Association peer review in December 2018, which recommended taking action to simplify and streamline guidance where possible. The revised Terms of Reference achieve this and provides clarity on the functions and responsibilities of the Joint Committee, Cabinet members, Cabinet full council and officers where currently the times of, uh, terms of reference are silent or ambiguous. Running alongside this work is a wider review of the governance framework of the crossing, including the opportunities there may be to update, change or replace the provisions of the Tamar Bridge Act in 1957 so as to allow the application for the indexation of tolls and the explanation, expiration of the crossing operating on its own corporate identity. Basically, one of the changes that came to light was during the COVID um, situation, there was no mechanism there for a recognized authority to stop the tolls tolling. So, due to safety of our staff on the uh, bridge uh, tolls collecting booths and also on the deck of the ferry, the cabinet members at that time took that responsibility. So that is now in writing as point 3.3 .3 shows on the paper, Lord Mayor. Thanks very much. Thank you. Councillor Pat Patel, I understand you're second in this report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, I am seconding this motion and uh, reserve my right. 
So, sorry, I didn't catch that. I you reserved your right. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak on this? Councillor Coker. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this is a good piece of work um, that really updates the Tall Point and Tamar Bridge Committee's um, decision-making process. I was the Cabinet member during the time that Councillor Dream um, mentions. Um, it was a difficult time. There were no set-down procedures to follow. This document clearly states going forward how the committee and cabinet members work. It's clear, concise, and also has a dispute resolution um, procedure in place. I also um, took part in the peer review um, and the learning that came out of that. It's only a shame, Lord Mayor, that this was done in 2018 and we're in 2022. Fully support uh, this motion in front of us today. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Do we have any other contributions to this um, item? No, oh, thank you. That's brilliant. We're going to go straight to the vote. So, oh, no, we're, going, we're not. I'm rush, rushing again. Sorry. Councillor Patel, would you like to use your right to speak? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Nothing further to add. Thank you. Councillor Dream, would you like to sum up? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, just, just to say that anyone joining us virtually, the, the vote is being taken on the following recommendation. The City Council agrees that the changes to the Thames of Reference as agreed by the Tamar Bridge and Torpoint Ferry Joint Committee on the 1st of October 2021 and the Audit and Governance Committee on the 9th, 29th of November 2021. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dreen. Um, my advisor will now take a recorded vote um, and he'll call your name in order. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Allen. Councillor Mrs. Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs. Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr. Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle? Four. Councillor Coker? Yeah, four. There must be something wrong, Lord Mayor, with the, with the, I, we cannot hear down here. Right, okay, I'll get that sorted for you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Coker. Councillor Collins? Four. Councillor Corbid? Four. Councillor Creswell? Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Goslin. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Lang. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Dr. Mahoney? Four. Councillor MacDonald? Four. Councillor Murphy? Four. Councillor Neal? Four. Councillor Nicholson? Four. Councillor Partridge? Four. Councillor Patel? Four. Councillor Pemberthy? Four. Councillor Mrs. Pengelly? Is that four? Not working. Four. Councillor Rennie? Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Singh. Four. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakeham. Four. Councillor Ms. Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Lord Mayor of Stenchen. Uh, motion's carried 45 to 1. That motion is carried 45 to one abstention. Thank you, councillors. Um, we're going to move on to item 15, uh, pay policy statement 2223. Councillor Riley, would you like to introduce your report? Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this report seeks to approve the council's pay policy statement for 2223. 
The Localism Act of 2011 requires every council to prepare a pay policy statement by the 31st of March each year for the following financial year, which is approved by the City Council. It sets out information about remuneration and policies and compares the highest paid employee with the lowest paid employees. To address low pay, the Council introduced the principles of foundation living wage by adding a discretionary non-contractual market supplement in 2014. Although the 2021 and 2022 pay awards are not known for local government pay, the Council will continue to pay this foundation living wage of £9.90 per hour from the 1st of April 2022, as the NJC lowest pay rate, excluding premises, uh, an increase of 40 pence per hour from £9.50. At the time of writing this report, and with pay awards pending, the ratio between the highest and lowest paid uh, employee, again excluding apprentices, is 1 to 8.56, which is from April 2022, and this is a significant reduction from 8 to 1 to 4, uh, sorry, reduction from 1 to 14 in 2012. I therefore propose, propose, Lord Mayor, that the Council approves this pay policy statement for 22-23. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, Councillor Patrick Nicholson, I understand you're seconding the report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm happy to second and reserve my right to speak, please. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Would anyone else like to speak on this item? No? Okay. Right. Councillor Creswell, sorry, I didn't see you. I, I just want to ask a question. So it's actually sort of, it's not really a, a, it's some sort of clarification really, because obviously it's quite, quite interesting data, but, um, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm new to the council and, uh, and such, but what I just wanted to ask is that um, looking at the um, balance, the gender balance that exists between um, male and female um, employees in the council, and you've got 63.5% um, female, 36.49% um, male, and then when it looks at um, uh, the um, chief executive, chief officer balance, you've got female 38.89% and male 61.11%. What I wanted to ask is, is there a um, figures going back over a period of time which shows a sort of like a trend rather than, because obviously being presented with those figures now, I don't know what has actually existed before because the trend could well be that there is um, a move, that you've got an increasing number of um, females who are in higher positions, um, which has happened over a period of years. So um, that's really what I was um, curious, and it would be actually interesting to see. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Creswell. Um, we're going to give you that answer outside of this meeting, OK? Thank you very much. Right, I think we established that there was nobody else to speak on this particular item. Uh, Councillor Riley, would you like to yeah, sum up? Oh, yeah, yes, nothing sorry. further to add, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Riley. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. No, that's, I, need no I don't need to add anything. I think we can go. Right, we're going to move to the vote, um, and my advisor will be calling out your name in order. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, the vote on the pay policy statement. I'll start with Councillor Allen. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs. Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr. Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corvid. Four. Councillor Cresswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Goslin. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Lang. Four. 
Councillor Loveridge. For. Councillor Dr Mahoney. For. <coughs> Councillor Macdonald. For. Councillor Murphy. For. Councillor Neil. For. Councillor Nicholson. For. Councillor Partridge. For. Councillor Patel. For. Councillor Pemberthy. For. Councillor Mrs Pengelly. For. Councillor Rennie. For. Councillor Riley. For. Councillor Salmon. For. Councillor Singh. For. Councillor Shea. For. Councillor Smith. For. Councillor Stevens. For. Councillor Stoneman. For. Councillor Tuffin. For. Councillor Wakeham. For. Councillor Ms Watkin. For. Councillor Wheeler. For. Lord Mayor, you're abstaining. 45 to 1, the motion's carried. Motion's carried, 45 to 1. Thank you, councillors. Now we move on to item 16 on the agenda. And uh, it's um, Clinton St. Mary Ward polling districts, polling places, polling stations, review of 2021-2022. Councillor John Riley, would you like to introduce your report? Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, after receiving feedback following the 2021 combined elections on the suitability of and access to Borrington School as a polling station, a review of the polling districts and places in the Plimpton St Mary Ward was carried out. The review covered polling districts RB and RC only. This review followed a clear methodology prescribed by legislation. The recommendation report presented to the Council today is the result of extensive research and public consultation, including representations from political parties and candidates, polling station providers and residents. The recommendations take into account all representations made in the consultation, including any issues regarding access to premises for persons with disabilities. The report also considers the impact of the next four years' worth of planning development in the city. As a result of this consultation, the review process proposes some changes to the boundaries between electoral districts and changes to polling stations, each one outlined in the recommendation report. On the 14th of January 2022, Audit and Governance Committee members were provided with a copy of the report and invited to share any comments with the uh, ERO ahead of the full council meeting. As prescribed by legislation, it is for the full council to make decisions on any proposed changes to polling districts or polling places and for the returning officer to select the polling stations. I therefore ask council to approve the proposed changes to polling districts for Plimpton St Mary set out in the recommendations report and to note the proposed changes to polling stations. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Councillor Vivian Pengeli, I understand you're seconding this report. Oh. Sorry, um, my script has been changed without my knowledge. Um, Councillor Patrick Nicholson, I understand you're seconding this report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Th thank you, Lord Mayor. If I may speak. Um at this juncture. Uh, certainly on behalf of my uh, ward colleagues for Plimpton St Mary Ward, welcome very much Councillor Riley's recommendation as a cabinet member today. Certainly feedback at the last election, but at the election before, there has been continuing concern, as there is indeed throughout Plymouth, of the use of school buildings mm. uh, for polling places. And we've sought um, over the years to reduce to an absolute minimum in Plimpton St Mary the use of schools. And this is the final school that we've come to a sensible compromise as an alternative premises. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Electoral Registration Department who have had extensive work over the last six or eight months on this issue uh, and to look at the suitability of the meeting room at Our Lady of Lord's Church, the Catholic Church um, in Vicarage Road, which does itself provide accessible and appropriate alternatives to that provided by the Borringdon Primary School. It, it should be noted, Lord Mayor, that the electorate for the polling district is our largest at 2,572 electors, but actually on the day 
uh, the electorate at the polling station will be 2038. And it's worth reminding the three um, objectors to the proposal uh, from the Plimpton St Mary Ward that indeed you know, over 500 electors in this polling district will vote by post. And the option to vote by post is there for anyone who would like actually to vote at Borringdon School but feel they're unable to do so moving forward and are unable to get to the alternative premises in Vicarage Road uh, to apply for a postal vote. I would urge uh, on behalf of my colleagues that Council approve this recommendation to allow an extra day of teaching uh, the pupils that live in the locality uh, and to give us an opportunity to see that the alternative premises works satisfactorily moving forward. So I'm happy to second the recommendation. I would welcome council support. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Um, do we have any speakers on this item? No? Let's move to the vote then. Uh, my I keep racing ahead, don't I? My mind's not really on it today, and you all know why. Um, Councillor Riley. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have nothing to add. I knew that. <laughs> um, right, we're going to move to the vote, and my advisor will be calling your name out in order. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll start with Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Mrs Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corbett. Four. Councillor Cresswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Goslin. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Lang. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Dr Mahoney. Four. Councillor MacDonald. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neal. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Partridge. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Councillor Pemberthy. Four. Councillor Mrs. Pengelly. Four. Councillor Rennie. Four. Councillor Riley. Councillor Salmon. Four. Councillor Singh. Four. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakem. Four. Councillor Watkin. <laughs> Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Lord Mayor of Suspension. Mm -hmm. The result of that vote was 45 4, one abstention, so the motion is carried. Right, we now progress on to item 17 on the agenda, which is calendar of meetings for 22 23. Councillor Riley, would like would you like to introduce your report? Yeah, thank you, more Lord Mayor. Uh, following the council approval of the full council dates for 22-23, I would like to move the indicative committee calendar for noting, calendar of supplies for information, and to aid planning for offers and external partners. We've deliberately kept away from the Diamond Jubilee dates for the Queen this year, uh, and the calendar could be subject to change, obviously in the new municipal year, dependent on wishes of chairs uh, and committee at, um, attendees. But obviously that would uh, be uh, themselves deciding in consultation with members and officers. Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor, for noting the dates. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, has anybody got any views on the dates? Uh, Councillor Tudor Evans, OBE, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Am I right in thinking it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, not a Diamond Jubilee? It's a Platinum Jubilee, yes. Councillor Pemberthy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I know we don't yet know which committees we'll be sitting on next year, but I know that I have been appointed by Council to three Cabinet Advisory Groups. When I read these papers, only two of them are listed. I wondered whether it's possible to get the Cabinet Advisory Group on Child Poverty added to the register, because otherwise we end up with clashes. Thank you very much. 
Absolutely, Councillor Pembrathy. Any other contributors to this particular item? Well, this is for noting, so we're not taking a vote on this. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Thank you. So the, the motion is noted. Um, right, item 18 is the motion on notice. We have just one important motion today, and um, I'd like to invite Councillor Vivian Pengelly to introduce the report. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Members of the Council, this motion comes at a time that has seen great tragedy in our city over the last 12 months. And my heart goes out to those families and loved ones that have borne the greatest sorrow in this. Tackling violence against women and girls is such a significant issue, and as a city, we are united in responding and tackling this together. While there is significant work already underway in our city, we know there is more to be done, and I am pleased that the Commission for Violence Against Women and Girls has been set up at pace to understand and respond to the growing concerns in our communities, our workplaces, our homes, online and in our schools. The work of this commission is vast. However, the members are knowledgeable, committed and passionate about getting it right. They have ambitious plans to hear from local people and organisations, review a wide range of evidence and understand innovative best practice already being delivered both locally and nationally. We must all come together to offer our support and accept the Commission findings in March. It is important that any recommendations within the Council's control we adopt and move forward to do whatever we can to change this landscape. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Pengelly. Councillor Lang, I understand you are second in the report. Would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Um, I am seconding the motion and I'd like to reserve my right to speak, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Would anyone else like to speak on this item? Uh, Councillor Neil. Thank you. Um, I'm totally supportive of the motion, um, but what I would urge uh, members to consider is whether we should, um, as a council, uh, be campaigning to do even more than this. Um, and we can do more than this by encouraging the government to modify the Housing Act 1996, um, part seven, which deals with homelessness. And currently, the situation is that people who are victims of domestic abuse who are no longer able to remain in their accommodation for fear of what might happen to them if they stay there um, are not mandatorily obliged to be accommodated. Um, now, for the benefit of, of members who may not know me, um, when I talk about housing and homelessness, I'm not talking as somebody with an opinion um, I've spent 30 years working in this field. Um, I've spent a considerable amount of time working with victims of abuse. So I would say to, to members present, have any of you ever spent a day of your lives sitting with a victim of domestic abuse and then having to apologise to them why we couldn't help them? Imagine how that feels. Um, and if you have spent a day of your life doing that, well, well done. Um, but try spending a week of your life, or a month of your life, or a year of your life, or 10 years of your life, or in my case, 30 years of your life, dealing with victims of domestic abuse, and knowing that the law actually doesn't provide them with the full uh, protection that they deserve and need. And I would ask members of this council to think about what I've just had to say to you, and to realize um, that the Housing Act 1996 is flawed. Well, Mayor, would Councillor Neil take an intervention? Yes, go on. Councillor Neil, um, it's a very interesting point, and thank you for bringing it to uh, Council's attention today. I is there a rationale why the government wouldn't change legislation to give a right to those suffering from domestic abuse 
to being rehoused under the provisions um, of, of homelessness? Thank you. I, I, I really don't think it's for me to judge what the, the government's uh, leanings are or why they might make them. Um, I'm perfectly able to say that this is an, an omission which has been made by both Labour and Conservative governments. So it's not something that I can blame one party for. It's happened consistently. I've worked in this field for 30 years and I've spent 30 years of my life doing my best to protect people who deserved protection, knowing that sometimes I couldn't, and I couldn't because the law didn't provide that protection. My view is that if somebody is a victim of domestic abuse, that's the, that is the test that is needed. There are a number of criteria in the Housing Act um, 96 that I've just outlined to you, and you can Google it and go and have a look for it, it's very easy to find. And you'll see that the first of the list of people who are deemed to be in priority need for accommodation are someone, a woman who is pregnant, uh, or someone who has someone who's pregnant living with them. Well, you shouldn't have to become pregnant to escape from domestic violence. It, it doesn't really require a lot of imagination to realize what the risk is in that. Um, so, all the way through, ever since 96, and I've been working in housing rather longer than since 96, the legislation has been flawed. And I ask this council to send its message to government yeah. that it is flawed legislation, that of course, of course we support um, the, the legislation that's there to protect victims of abuse, but rather than rather than pat them on the back, rather than try to meet them and be nice to them, let's do something positive and real about this and actually give an absolute guarantee to anybody who is a victim of abuse, not that we might leave them on the streets because they're not in priority need for accommodation, but because they are in priority need for accommodation and we are here to rescue them, to help them, and to help them move to a safer place. And unless we can do that as a society, then we are fundamentally flawed. And I urge all members to listen to what I'm saying to you today and to send your messages to members of parliament to do something about this and put right what has been wrong um, for nearly 30 years of my life and 30 years of my working life. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neil. Councillor... I nearly said Darren. J James Stoneman, sorry. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, I couldn't think of a more important topic to get, uh, deliver my maiden speech um, than violent, the violence against women and girls in the city. I, today I speak in support of the motion in front of us and I urge every councillor in here to do the same. In November, Plymouth saw one of the most callous acts it has seen in history, something that shocked the city and rocked our community. Our city now unfortunately joins the list of others in the country where women and girls fear leaving their homes for the fear of what might happen if they're going out with friends, if they're going on a night out, or if they're just waiting at a bus stop to go into the city centre. It's a, damning, it's a damning indictment and a sad reflection that women and girls are afraid to leave their homes in a city that champions freedom and the right to live as we wish. My Lord Mayor, the events of November have left a mark in my mind, as have the events in the not so distant past around the country. And I am pleased to see that the council has taken a decision to form a commission to look into, uh, to look into uh, what the city can do to make sure that women and girls in our city feel safe to yeah. leave their homes. The motion sets out clearly the aims and objectives of this commission in tackling violence against women and girls within our city, and, it's, and the depth and scope of the commission's work is fantastic. And I am pleased to see such a detailed list of objectives um, in order to present council with a coherent list of recommendations that are based on thorough research and understanding of the needs and desires of the women and girls in our city. A fine example of the Commission's research is conducting uh, the survey currently active on Plymouth City Council's website. Um, I've shared this on my social media pages with residents in Buckland, and I hope every councillor in here has done the same with their residents. 
I am very happy to see that the motion before us is committing the Council to act upon the recommendations of the Commission and committing Cabinet members to look at what they can do in their portfolios to make women and girls feel safe. The recommendations that will be coming in March will have come from work with real people, with real stories, and from experts within their fields. These are voices we cannot ignore and we must not ignore, and their voices uh, need to be loud and they need to be heard by all of us in this room, and I am pleased that this motion makes that clear. Lord Mayor, by voting for this motion, we as a Council are sending a clear message that we are working towards a common goal and a common desire to make women and girls of Plymouth feel safe. To feel safe in the city where they live and to feel safe to leave their houses. So we do not have to go through what we have been through in this city and in too many cities across the country. This is a matter of utmost importance and I look forward to seeing the result of the Commission's um, investigation in March. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, James. That was very passionate. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Rebecca Smith. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, I just want to start by responding to what Councillor Neil said. Um, we actually had a very good conversation in the tea break, and having worked not for 30 years, um, more like probably nine, about six months, for the Council's homeless team, a long time ago, 25 years ago, I've seen firsthand what he was talking about in terms of the need for that prioritisation of who, who gets to be considered homeless and who doesn't. And so, as I will advise everybody in this room to do, he's going to send hopefully some evidence to me so that we can bring that into the work of the Commission. And as, as you will know in point um, two of the resolution this afternoon, it specifically says we will identify and seek to influence any areas of national policy that need revising. And to me, it sounds straight away like that is a very good contender for one of those recommendations. However, back to my actual speech. <laughs> um, as chair of the Plymouth Commission on Violence Against Women and Girls, I welcome this significant cross-party motion on notice and want to thank Councillor Pengeli and Councillor Lang for tabling it today and enabling the debate that we're having at the moment. Thank you also to those who've spoken to me today, um, and I would just suggest that anybody who is interested in submitting any of the comments that you make this evening as evidence, you have, as you've heard from Councillor Stoneman, the survey is live on the website. Um, you can email me and I will forward it in, or you can contribute um, directly through a text feed that is also on the website. Now, I'm not planning on speaking for long, as I have plenty of opportunity to do so at other, at other times. And I want to ensure that colleagues on both sides of the room have time to make their speeches, some of which I know, as we've already seen, are maiden speeches. However, as chair of the commission, I do want to speak briefly on the work we have done so far to update you and to speak about my hopes for the coming weeks before we publish in two months' time. As I said when I was first asked to chair this very important piece of work, I wish that as a city we did not need to do it. I wish that we did not see the tragic events of 2021 take place in our city and the victims we saw join the growing list of victims across the country as well as further afield as we saw so tragically last week with the killing of Ashling Murray in Ireland. However, whilst we will never wipe away the tragedies of 2021, I am proud of the reaction of this city and the commission that has been set up to tackle the issues of violence against women and girls head on. In the space of a few short weeks, we long-listed, short-listed and invited experts from across the city and from further afield to come and sit as members of the Commission. In many ways, it was a wish list where our wishes came true as those we invited accepted the invitation and have thrown themselves into the work with energy and commitment already. I'm particularly pleased that ex-Crown Chief Prosecutor for the North West, Nazir Afzal OBE, has joined us as, as an advisor. His input so far has been invaluable and his experience and perspective is already taking our work to another level, something that I'm sure we will all benefit from in due course. If you know me at all, you will know that I'm not one to gush. All that said, it is truly an honour to be working with the men and women of the Commission. Academics, business experts, members of the legal profession, representatives from education, healthcare and the criminal justice system, as those who work on the ground already with victims and survivors. 
Right from our first meeting, they have given of their knowledge and expertise, and as a result, we have shaped a wide-ranging evidence-gathering programme to enable as many voices as possible to be heard from across the city. You've also heard this afternoon in other points where we are also holding an innovation session where we will hear from those who are already delivering creative programmes to deal with the areas such as culture change, education of boys and men, as well as practical solutions to help women feel safer. The underlying aim of which will be to see violence against women and girls at the hands of men in our city reduce significantly. Whilst we may be faced with an epic task, we are all hopeful that by shining a light on this crucial issue, the fact that far too many women and girls experience violence at the hands of men and all the associated impacts on their home, children, livelihood and ultimately the enjoyment of their life and their future, we will see things shift. We will see a safer Plymouth, women and girls feeling able to live their lives and most important, less women and girls in Plymouth experiencing violence at the hands of men. I'm grateful for the Council's support for the Commission so far, especially the many members of staff at all levels who have been tasked to deliver on this important piece of work and who are doing so exceptionally well already. In fact, it's an absolute privilege to get to work with them. I'm grateful that this Council is prepared to commit resources to the recommendations of this Commission. I welcome the decision that has already been made to pursue white ribbon status and I look forward to hearing what steps can be taken to ensure that the council leads the way as both an employer and as the deliverer of key services for the residents of Plymouth as we all work together to ensure that violence against women and girls declines in our city. Now admittedly I haven't been but as short as time, I said. Your time is up, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, that's fine. Councillor yeah, so Smith, I mean you spoke very eloquently then. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Dr Pam Buckham. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I had a recent piece of casework where a female resident contacted me expressing concern about a bus stop in the ward. The stop has no shelter and behind it is a large sort of copse or woodland and a change to the management of the greenery has left the bus stop very exposed behind. I know that if I were waiting there at night that I would feel exactly as the resident expressed, that I could easily be pulled into the bushes and out of sight of residents or passers-by. So I put the problem to officers and received a response stating that there was nowhere else that the stop could go and a suggestion that the resident could simply wait near a house, away from the bus stop and then return to the stop to flag the bus down when it approached. As a woman living in this city, Lord Mayor, I have no doubt that you will agree with me that telling women they should not wait at a public bus stop if they feel unsafe there is an unacceptable response. Women should not have to use public services differently from men in order to feel safe. I'm sure that all the women in this room who have used public transport have made decisions like I have about which bus stop to get off and what feels safe, choosing to walk further or, or double back rather than feeling vulnerable at a particular stop. I welcome therefore this motion on notice, in particular the commitment to resource and act upon the recommendations of the Violence Against Women and Girls Commission as they pertain to council responsibilities. This council is currently undergoing a revision of the location of bus stops and shelters across the city, removing those which it considers are not well used. But this appears to be happening entirely independent of any public consultation, by which I mean a conversation with comments being considered and not a one-way communication plan. It also seems to be happening in isolation to the Commission and the concerns of women in this city who rely on public transport. When the draft bus strategy came to the Brexit Infrastructure and Legislative Change Overview and Scrutiny Committee, the committee raised particular concerns about the quality of the data from the consultation and the lack of active consideration about the different experiences of women who use buses. It seems that our concerns were not communicated beyond the specific context of that particular agenda item. And of course, it's not just bus stops or buses that are a concern. The issues with replacement lighting across the city are particularly felt by women and girls. And I know that in my ward, the Together for Childhood project has worked with young people in Ernie Settle to consider what changes could be made in the public realm to help children feel safer and less at risk of sexual assault. But I've not seen evidence that the council has responded to this process by making changes which would really promote the feelings of safety. 
So I hope that as a consequence of this motion, the Council will review how it engages with the public about public realm infrastructure and that all areas of the Council will proactively include the experiences of women and girls in decisions about the public realm, such as the forthcoming bus stop audit, in a meaningful way. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Buckham. Um, I think we need to get an investigation into your claim there about the bus stop because that has absolutely mortified me. Um, Councillor Jeremy Gosley. Thank you very much, Lai Lord Mayor. Um, unlike in um, other political day domains, we don't need to wait for our commission to publish their report to start to make real improvements for safety for women and girls. We won't see any improvements or outcomes from the committee until May at the very earliest, six months since the tragic death of Bobby Ann. While women and girls have heard warm words from some, if not all, in this chamber, they've seen little in the way of action. It's a long road to equality and safety, but I think we can make a real start now. Only recently, Ashley Murphy, a 23-year-old teacher, was murdered while out running in Ireland. Local women describe many of our streets and parks as being no-go areas after dark, including Central Park. It's not fair that 50% of our population feel that these spaces are unavailable to them 50% of the time. And this is why there have been over 600 signatories to a petition to see better lighting in our parks, which would allow women and girls to feel safer while jogging, walking their dog, or crossing our parks. I support this motion, but I really want to ask the council cabinet leaders to act now to plan some real concrete improvements for inclusion in the upcoming budget and to help protect women and girls from across our city, including better park lighting, asking women to steer clear of certain areas or wear high-vis jackets and take their chances is simply not good enough. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Gosling. Councillor Charlotte Carlisle. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I welcome this motion and I fully support the Commission and the chance to shine a light on violence against women and girls. I know this Commission will bring peace of mind to many of my Compton residents. Yes, there are quick fixes to help women feel safer going around Plymouth, but fundamentally, the only way to make major steps in eradicating this problem is through education, open talks and training to enable people to speak up. Recently, there have been high profile cases. Ashling Murphy, as was noted before, was just going for a run at 4pm in a well populated area when she was brutally murdered. Closer to home, Bobby Ann tragically lost her life whilst innocently waiting for a bus. Sarah Everhard was killed by someone she believed was there to protect her. I personally recall a terrifying incident when I was 17 and on my way to work early one morning. As I walked down a deserted road, a man crossed the road and started walking behind me. I heard him running, uh, he grabbed my shoulder. Luckily, I broke free, I ran and I hid in someone's front garden behind their bins. I, I heard him searching for me, but again, luckily, uh, somebody was walking their dog up the road and he left. The incident obviously left me shaken, but not surprised, unfortunately. Many of my friends encountered similar types of situations. And I dare say, if you ask many of the women in this room alone, you would sadly hear similar stories. But whilst we can ask our cabinet members to review their portfolio and make changes in the city, we also need to remember the many other women and girls that making the streets safer won't help completely. In the year ending March 2020, the Crime Survey for England and Wales estimated 1.6 million women aged 16 to 74 in England and Wales experienced domestic abuse. That's 7% of the female population. The Crime Survey also estimated that 3% of women aged 16 to 74 years old in England and Wales experienced sexual assault including attempts, and 5% experienced stalking. Unfortunate to say, these trends have remained similar over the last 10 years. And before it's whispered that not all men are like this, yes, you are correct, it's not all men. But we do need all men 
to stand by our side and teach the next generation how to behave, to back the learnings in schools when their child gets home, to speak up against colleagues and friends. Fundamentally, we need education. We need to be in schools and showing boys how to treat women and girls with respect. We need bystander training like First Light Southwest Deliver to empower people to call out bad behaviour. With regards to Sarah Everhard's killer, a police officer, he was nicknamed by his own colleagues the rapist. If the police themselves felt they couldn't call out one of their own, how can the ordinary man on the street? I once heard a colleague read out a headline about CCTV capturing a rape attack, and he said, oh look, free porn, which the men around him laughed. Maybe with training offered to everyone, including myself, one of us could have actually dealt with that situation rather than ignoring it. I thank everyone working on the Commission, and I look forward to seeing the changes and positivity it will undoubtedly bring. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Chaz Singh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm pretty sure that we're all in support of this um, motion that's in front of us today. Um, I've had separate emails stroke conversations with Councillor Rebecca Smith to, to highlight really that <clears throat> as councillors we all get bits of casework, whether it's domestic violence, but even within a city as far down in the southwest here, um, I've, I've personally done casework around on a base violence and I think that's something that also needs to be uh, raised awareness of. Some people might not believe this but believe it or not the southwest is a bit of a safe haven for those fleeing from those areas where on a base violence is much more higher than other parts of the country. And, and my experience, I think we've, we've all got experiences of dealing with agencies. <clears throat> And I emailed Devon and Cornwall Police in regards to a case. And it was so strange because when I spoke to the officer, he said he was really passionate about honour-based violence and that he was going to do something, he was going to address it. And then I just thought he won the lottery and disappeared from the face of the earth. It's only when I complained to senior officers in Devon and Cornwall Police, I got a, re a reply the same day. So some of it is also like the attitude, it doesn't happen here, or it doesn't affect us. And the Commission has a, a massive opportunity to say, if you look down on one of the bullet points here, to ensure there is strong and visible leadership, I also think, and I've addressed this to Councillor Smith, it's also about having that diverse leadership. You know, we're not there to tick boxes, we are there to raise awareness. And if we're not sat at the table, it's not going to happen. And I know we've got some key influential people who have sat or who are sitting on the commission, but it's also making sure that those points are raised at that level. I totally agree with Councillor Neal's 30 years of experience in regards to tackling domestic violence and the housing issue. For me, the, the golden opportunity for the Commission is to make sure that those points are raised and actually tackled to an extent where we, we do address it and it is taken seriously. But one of the bad notes of the Commission is this kind of, I don't, I, I, maybe the word hounding may be wrong, but my, my observation is this is not a political football. This is not something you can just call in. This is not something you can just say, we want it now. This is going to take time. So I'm aiming that on to the members on the other side specifically and I think you need to really wind yourselves in and be part of the process rather than you can laugh Bill it's not funny 
It's not funny. Yeah? And be part of the process. Help the Commission to do the job it's been set up to do. It's not something you just jump on and you think, oh, here's another bandwagon. It's people's lives. It's serious. It could be any one of our relatives. It could be a friend who lives down the road. But we are key people in this room who can make that change. So I absolutely support the work that Councillor Smith has put forward. Also welcome the White Ribbon Accreditation, which is saying we are serious about violence against women and girls. So let the Commission do the work, contribute it. It's not political. Nobody goes around and says, I'm going to do this because of that. But there's an opportunity for all of us, and I mean all of us, to contribute to it and make a difference for the people and the, the women and the girls in this city that Thank face you, that Chan threat. Thank you, Councillor Singh. Your time's up. Thank you Thank very you. much for your contribution. Um, can I remind members, um, I hope you've all got your mobile phones off um, or you've got them on silent. Thank you. Um, Councillor David James. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Neil made a very valid point when he mentioned uh, about uh, the victims of domestic violence and abuse. Um, I cannot begin to understand you know, the trauma that um, women and children are going through um, when they've been made homeless um, through domestic abuse. Um, being a victim of domestic abuse is traumatic in its own right, uh, but it's unimaginable um, when they're made homeless as well. Unfortunately, domestic abuse is on the rise, and thankfully the government are aware of this, and uh, they have donated a certain amount of money towards um, um, homelessness as a result of domestic abuse. So I fully support this motion, and uh, this motion on notice, and I hope that the Commission will look forward and investigate this area of um, um, violence against women through domestic abuse um, and being um, made homeless. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor James. Councillor Bill Wakeham. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, I'll be as brief as I can on this very emotive subject, uh, but I'm sure I speak for all of us here as a councillor when I say we fully support this commission. And uh, I'd like to help personally in any way that I can. And uh, I want to show my support for Rebecca and all the team that are doing a magnificent job and I would hope that uh, we can uh, work together with the Cabinet and uh, certainly make big strides because we all feel so very strongly about this. And, uh, you know, I just can't believe in this day and age that we're in this situation. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wakeham. Councillor Sudan. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. I wasn't expecting to speak on this, so... Um it was, I was glad to hear that we were going to go for white ribbon accreditation because it will help the council ensure there is a focus throughout the organisation because I think there needs to be a step change in attitude and action and the way we use our language. Um, this up until, I'm afraid I'm going to have to just call Councillor Singh out just a little bit because we were having a very respectful conversation I think most people in this room have been either affected or heard of a story where someone they know has not been safe when they've been walking or at home or in their schools, in their workplaces. Women get harassed and spoken to in negative ways and they have done all of my life um, and you'd think it would change. So I was really appalled then when I think the quote was something like, those on the other side should wind themselves in. That is not helpful. Everybody in this chamber today has a responsibility to be respectful to each other, as well as for our residents and how we represent people. 
and actually politics is really important. The reason that point five was put into this amendment is because cabinet members can have a real impact on how we look at protecting women and children and girls when they go around their ordinary lives. You know, they have to go to school, so the education services has a big responsibility, our social care services have a big responsibility, how we move around the city, how we visit places, how we access things, where there are safe places, where there are refuges, where there's decent homes. That comes across everything that we do as a council. So I do find it appalling that we are being told to wind ourselves in because that isn't how any of us should be spoken to. Domestic violence and abuse and having people safe is everybody's, everybody's worry. So I really do hope that we can continue this debate now and respect what we're trying to achieve as a council. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Natalie Harrison. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, I wasn't going to speak either, but uh, having worked with um, victims of domestic abuse, uh, I echo uh, what Councillor Neil has said. And um, for me, it's about f women and girls or women feeling that they actually can leave. I totally echo what, and agree with what he said, that actually many women will stick in a situation which is not uh, safe, which is not a good environment for their, fam for their children because they have nowhere to go and they're worried about the only option being go going to a refuge. If they feel that they have uh, a chance that they might be put into suitable accommodation, not bed and breakfast or a refuge, but suitable accommodation, they're more likely to make a decision sooner rather than staying in um, a violent or abusive situation. And uh, then hopefully that will have less impact on their children who, for both the women and the, and the families, uh, will be uh, living with the, the consequences for many, many years to come. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Glenn Jordan. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, like Councillor Neil um, raised about um, domestic violence, I think if you've been a councillor as long as I have, and I think most of us in here have been, um, you will end up having a, come across somebody who is suffering from or needs support um, to get away from domestic violence. And it is the most upsetting, stressful, and frustrating at times um, situation that any of us can get involved with. Um, but, um, and, and, and hopefully this is something that, this, uh, that Rebecca and her team will be able to try to smooth out some of those edges so we can get people to safety quicker and supported better. But what got me thinking about this when, we were reading the, when I was reading the paperwork, I, I celebrated 33 years of marriage on Friday took my wife out for a meal and after that went home and we started reading through the papers. I then had a conversation with my two daughters, or with my daughter, sorry, um, my youngest, about how she felt and how things had changed. So someone from my generation, when we were younger, we went down the pub, you were introduced to somebody who was um, a friend of a friend or a relation or you met someone at work. Um, and the worst thing you had to worry about is drinking too much and the pair of you being drunk. But when I was talking to my daughter, she was actually saying, well, she's actually had an incident where one of her friends had a drink spiked. Now, they were all aware of spiking and they were all um, trying, trying to look out for the summits, but still somebody managed to spike one of their drinks. Fortunately, there was three of them and they managed to get the, the friend whose drink had been spiked home and to safety. But if that girl hadn't been there, if, if my daughter and her other friend hadn't been there, that girl could have been in a lot of trouble. That's something of my generation we didn't have to worry about. And the, the women and the girls of my generation didn't have to worry about. Not to the extent, definitely, now that it is happening. 
Um, one of the other things that um, has changed is um, um, internet dating. It was never really a thing when I was around. Again, my daughter was sat on a sofa and, um, and she got a message, uh, I think it was about eight, nine o'clock at night. One of her friends was going on an internet date and she had arranged with her friends that if they were going on an internet date, they were going to take a photograph of the photograph of the guy that they were meeting. One, to make sure it was who it was on the profile, but two, if anything happened, her friends would actually know who she was last seen and who and what he looked like. And it's things like that that make me think, we sh in this day and age, we shouldn't be thinking like this. And, and, and girls shouldn't be having to take those sort of measures. And, and as a father, I, it makes me feel frustrated that there's not more that I can do. So when I read on comments online, like somebody saying, well, 99% of men aren't the problem. Well, actually, that 99% of the men are the problem if they're going to sit down and not actually recognize that there is a problem. So that is why I am wholeheartedly supporting this, and I'm wholeheartedly supporting the work that Rebecca does, because we need to get a handle on this, and we need to get a handle on it today. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Councillor Margaret Cor Corvid. Thank you, my, my Lord Mayor. I really appreciate the debate. I really appreciate the fact that this commission is going to be established, and I will do everything that I can to support its work. As this is a very difficult remark for me to make. As many of you know, um, I'm standing down in May because I've been the subject of online harassment. Um, many of the people who have harassed me for my background, you know, for my identity, for the fact that my eye is crossed, are men. And you know what? I've got a really thick skin. The reason that I take this so gravely, gravely seriously is because there is a powerful link between the dehumanization of women and girls and the violence against women and girls. I am appealing to the commission, to the counselors, to the leaders, to the scholars who are coming together to work on this issue to take a broad and deep approach because the assault of women and girls comes from the deep-seated cultural presupposition that women and girls are not people. Objectifying language and concepts, sexism and marginalization in the home, in the community, in the workplace, from the cradle to the grave. There have been some comments by members that this didn't happen to women when they were young. I must beg to differ and to direct you to the scholarship because it did. Male violence, or just violence against women and girls in general, by and large, comes from misogyny, which has been with us globally as a society since time out of mind. My Lord Mayor, it is terrifying for me to make this speech, and I want to say thank you to the member of my group who encouraged me to make this speech today, because it will be heard and it will be seen. And I'm not making this speech to ask for help for myself. I am making this speech to fix in the mind of Councillor Smith and the committee who is going to be doing this work, this commission, excuse me, to remember it's not just about lights at bus stops, although that's important. It's not just about educating the police and our frontline services, which is important. It is about changing our culture from the ground up. And it is the, the, the place of every one of us when they see or hear a woman or girl being dehumanized to call it out, to learn. We can do better, we must do better. Thank you. Wow, we've had some powerful speeches this evening. 
Um, I just want to thank members for sharing their experiences and their views this evening. Um, Councillor Lang, you reserved your right to speak. Would you like to speak now? Yes, I would. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to second this important motion because it's vital that this commission succeeds and achieves real and lasting change for the women and girls of our city. I'm hoping there will be innovative and important recommendations once the commission completes its work. And I'm glad our amendments around resources and portfolio holder buy-in form part of the motion before us. A recommendation also emerged from budget scrutiny at the end of last week around resourcing of any commission recommendations. No one is pretending this is easy, but we can change things. I really believe this, and we must. We have a cross-party will, and we are fortunate in Plymouth to have a range of engaged, experienced and wise partners who are also committed to shaping and implementing the recommendations. But what we also need to do, and this is vital to succeeding on this issue, is to change the narrative. We have to make it unacceptable to employ the rhetoric of blame, of the idea of somebody putting themselves in a compromising position. We have to do away with the notion that what a woman is wearing or where she finds herself, somewhere less salubrious, that she is somehow at fault if something happens to her. Now, I don't kid myself that this will be easy. This is decades, as Councillor Corvid said, if not hundreds of years of thinking we are contending with here. But I ask you to think about what exactly you are saying when you say things like that. What you are doing is asking women to circumscribe the way they live and move in the world, to regulate their behaviour, to regulate their routines. <laughs> Imagine if it was men who were asked to restrict their movements instead. I mean, that would be one way women could move around without fear, but it simply wouldn't happen. And if it did, there would be uproar or the kind of inappropriate Facebook posts which got Councillor Deacon into hot water last year. It's astonishing that it provokes ridicule to even suggest that men should change the way they interact with the world. But this is what we ask women to do. This is what we teach our daughters knowingly and unknowingly to do. I was shocked in the aftermath of Bobby Ann's terrible death when my daughter described the elaborate way she and her friends keep tabs on one another on nights out, leaving a hair in a taxi so their DNA is there. Not so they feel safe necessarily, but so they will know where to direct the police if one of them disappears. My son and his friends don't do this. They don't have to. We didn't have this exact mechanism when I was young. It was keys threaded through my fingers on the walk from the bus stop to home and a pot of white pepper in my bag, as advised by the mother of one of my school friends. Three rings on the phone to say that you were home. And I tell you, I really don't need Councillor Singh to tell me how to feel about this commission or how to interact with it or why it's so important. Here are some, just some of the kind of things I've encountered. From the first time a man flashed at me at the age of eight at an outdoor swimming pool, a revolting incident on the tube, which I won't go into here, to being chased across a park, feeling like I was running for my life. But these incidences are unremarkable, as Councillor Carlyle's eloquent maiden speech and Councillor Corvid's brave words prove in their prevalence. They're almost banal in their regularity because every single woman I've spoken to about this subject has similar stories of their own, and it is tiresome, and it is tiring. Plymouth has a chance to make a difference, to make this change, to lead this conversation, not to teach our girls to be careful how they dress, where they walk or where they go, but to teach boys not to harass or attack or abuse, whether in the real or the virtual world, that a few drinks, a short skirt is never a defence to aggression or unwanted touching. Now, I know this debate makes people uncomfortable. Some of you in this room might be feeling uncomfortable, but I ask you to sit with that discomfort and think about why it makes you feel that way. We can't carry on like this. All the streetlights in the world, all the taxis on the planet will not cancel out the fact that women and girls have the right not to be attacked, whatever they wear, wherever they go, whatever they drink, whoever they are. No caveats, no excuses. 
Plymouth is taking the lead and we should all be proud that we have this important opportunity to really make this count. We owe it to the thousands and thousands of women with lives so full of potential which were cut short or damaged in such dreadful ways. We owe it to London's Sarah Everard and Sabina Nessa. We owe it to Tullamore's Ashling Murphy and we owe it to our own Bobby Ann McLeod. That is why I'm seconding this motion and I ask all members to support it. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Good job. I'm not sat out there to say my piece, isn't it? Um, Councillor Mrs. Pengelly, would you like to sum up? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, there's been a lot of discussion this evening about domestic abuse. Can I assure members of the Council? that we work extremely hard um, in my department. We do have a special department that deals exclusively with domestic abuse. Quite often, victims of domestic abuse, families end up in a refuge centre, which is wonderful for feeling safe. And the first thing they have to do is to go to somewhere where it is safe. That is usually a refuge centre. And then that's where we come in and we do everything we can to find them a decent family home for the family to live in away from the domestic abuse. And I can assure all members here, especially Councillor Neil, that we are working extremely hard at that. It's only a small department we have. We do get grants down from government to help out but that is what we do. We do not like anyone at all in our city living in fear. And it is fear. It must be dreadful, dreadful every evening to hate the person who's coming home to your house and is going to abuse you. That must be terrible to live like that. And we have very good refuge centres, but they are not permanent places. And that's where we come in, our role is to find them good family homes and then also to give them support. But I'm delighted that so many members chose to speak on this subject. And to all those members who've contributed today, thank you. I'm pleased that this very important motion has been discussed here in the Guildhall today. And I am sure the chairman of the commission, Councillor Rebecca Smith, will take on board all your suggestions remarks and ideas. There are five resolutions which I will not read out as they are all there in your papers for you to see and read, but I do hope that you all support them. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mrs. Pengelly. That's uh, Councillor Pengelly. That's <clears throat> right. Um, we are now going to move to the vote. It will be a recorded vote, so your names will be called out in order. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. We'll start with Councillor Allen. Four. Councillor Mrs Aspinall. Four. Councillor Bingley. Four. Councillor Bridgman. Four. Councillor Dr Buchan. Four. Councillor Carlisle. Four. Councillor Coker. Four. Councillor Collins. Four. Councillor Corvid. Four. Councillor Cresswell. Four. Councillor Dan. Four. Councillor Derrick. Four. Councillor Downey. Four. Councillor Dream. Four. Councillor Evans. Four. Councillor Gosling. Four. Councillor Harrison. Four. Councillor Hendy. Four. Councillor Hume. Four. Councillor James. Four. Councillor Jordan. Four. Councillor Kelly. Four. Councillor Lang. Four. Councillor Loveridge. Four. Councillor Dr Mahoney. Four. Councillor MacDonald. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neal. Four. Councillor Nicholson. Four. Councillor Partridge. Four. Councillor Patel. Four. Councillor Pemberthy. Four. Councillor Mrs. Pengelly. Four. Councillor Rennie. Four. Councillor Riley. Four. Councillor Salmon. Councillor Singh. Four. Councillor Shea. Four. Councillor Smith. Four. 
Councillor Stevens. Four. Councillor Stoneman. Four. Councillor Tuffin. Four. Councillor Wakeham. Four. Councillor Ms. Watkin. Four. Councillor Wheeler. Four. Lord Mayor. Four. 100%. Forty-six in favour. The motion is carried. Forty-six in favour. The motion is carried. Thank you so much for all your contributions and your personal stories that you've shared with us this afternoon. Um, I'm very proud of a lot of you in this room this afternoon because uh, you've spoken so eloquently on a subject that I'm very, very passionate about. Thank you. Right, after drawing a breath, we'll move on to item 19, and that's questions by councillors. Um, members, can I ask uh, you to ask your questions of the leader, the cabinet, and members of or committee chairs? Please indicate if you would like to speak by raising your hand, and I'll call you to speak. Please note that we have 45 minutes for questions and answer session. Due to the layout of the room, I would ask that cabinet members when responding, do not turn around and continue to face forward. Please do it so, so it's easy for you to speak into the microphone. We understand that it, these times are unusual and I would like to reassure members that responders are not being rude by not facing you to reply. Questions should be no more than a minute long and answers no more than two minutes long. Uh, members may ask for a supplementary question, not a statement, which must be related to the original question. Same time restrictions apply. Um, Councillor Andrea Loveridge. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. My question goes to Councillor Maddie Bridgman. Um, Councillor Bridgman, as restrictions are being lifted on Thursday, can you please give me an update as to whether uh, the staff at Chelston Meadow can assist the general public with um, heavy bulky waste, please? Thank you for the question, Councillor Loveridge. Um, I think what we're currently doing is actually carrying out a risk assessment, but I know even through the pandemic, staff have been helping certain individuals when they, where they've been struggling with bulky items from their vehicles. Um, it has been reported to me that, you know, there was an old lady recently who, would, her son had very kindly put an armchair into the boot of a car, sent her off to Chelsea, and um, with no means of actually getting it from the car. So they do help in, in certain circumstances and they are happy to help if, if you know, with safe, safe distancing, etc. But yeah, I think the best thing we can do is actually, I'll, I'll request a risk assessment and I'll get back to you via email if that's okay. Thank you. No supplementary, my Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Loveridge. Councillor Pat Patel. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Uh, questions for uh, Mark Deacon or Councillor Mark Deacon. Uh, what plans do the council have going forward to return to a full library service from next year, next financial year? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, and um, thank you, Councillor Patel. When this administration took, all, took control of the council last year, I asked my customer service team how much it would cost to restore the libraries to their full opening hours. I'm passionate about a library service, which was why I looked into the matter. The answer that I had back was that it would cost £467,000 to restore the hours that it would need to open up the libraries. Unfortunately, the council has to make efficiency savings, as we have done for, for many years now, and we will need to do again in the future. The continued restrictions that COVID has placed upon the service also is why we haven't opened up the libraries fully. Due to social distancing, we have only opened up a proportion of um, personal computers that we have. We can't open up a meeting, uh, meeting rooms that the libraries have due to in, in, uh, inadequate ventilation. The library staff have, um, have had to, to reconfigure the layout of libraries. Customers are encouraged not to stay too long, or this because of COVID rules. 
We have had COVID grants from the government, which is reducing year upon year, some of which have found its way through to my customer service team. At the start of my tenure, I was asked to protect the libraries. This, are, this I have done whilst grappling with the lack of resources that we have inherited and the continuing demands that COVID brings. However, despite this, I have increased the hours in Southway, Plimpton and Denport libraries by using the same number of staff more efficiently. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Patel, do you have a supplementary? I do, Lord Mayor. Uh, the supplementary is, when do you envisage a progression to a return to a fuller service and the reinstatement of such things as holiday activity clubs, storytelling and job clubs? It is clear that libraries all over the country are in a state of flux, and libraries in Plymouth are no different. There aren't many cities outside that have 11 libraries located throughout a city suburbs. Most councils have drastically cut back on their libraries. They have also combined them with different council services to make their customer services more efficient, more responsive to customer needs and, and environmentally greener. Something that I'm very keen to bring to Plymouth once we get the trial underway, which was delayed due to COVID. In future, the way we operate the library model may have to be looked at. After we have done this, I can envisage a library model that will be different, but more comprehensive. As for activities in libraries, such as holiday clubs, storytelling, rhyme time and the memory cafes, and they will open up after March. Some are available now. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Deacon. Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is to Councillor Jonathan Dream, because um, I believe he's responsible for enforcement of highways. Um, a number of ca taxi drivers have contacted me, and I've spoken to a couple of them, and they've raised some concerns about the number of um, cars that are parked in taxi ranks. So could you explain what's going on and what, what the council's doing to combat this, please? Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Through you, Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, yes, I'm aware this was brought to my attention by the Plymouth Licensed Taxi Association uh, last year. Um, they had some photographic evidence which they showed with me. Um, the enforcement teams have been out there. It's a continuing operation at the moment. At the last count when I asked, I think there were over 250 PCNs have been um, ticketed and issued for people parking in taxi parking bays that shouldn't have been there. It's an ongoing operation. Uh, we're continuing, especially in the city centre and other locations outside of the city centre. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Jordan? Uh, thank you, Councillor Dream. No, Lord Mayor, I don't have a supplementary, thank but I will pass much. that information on to the tax trade. Thank you very much, Councillor Jordan. Councillor Singh. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is to probably the leader of the council. Um, I was just looking back at some recent statistics from the census 2001-2011 and have seen a double increase in members of black, Asian, minority ethnic communities. Given my experience of what I've had from anti-Sikhism in Plymouth, from Plymouth Labour, and with the current situation with Nusrat Ghani in the Conservative Party, how will the leader ensure that members of diverse... Um, Councillor Singh, can you just hold fire one moment? Yeah. Um, Councillor Evans, what's your point of order, please? Uh, is it in order for Councillor Singh to imply falsely again that uh, he was subject to anti-Sikhism? Uh, he wasn't subject to anti-Sikhism. He was asked to moderate his inappropriate behaviour against senior members of other authorities. Um, he, persists, he persists, Lord Mayor, in opinion, making these yeah. allegations without foundation, and it would be most wrong if you were to allow right. him to continue to do it in a public forum. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Um, that wasn't a point.
Councillor James Stoneman. Thank you. My question is for Councillor Jonathan Dream. Um, in the last full council meeting, you said that the trial for vehicle-free school zones was going well. Are there any plans to roll any more of those out throughout um, this year? Thank you for the question, Councillor Stoneman. Yes, there are. The team have plans. I don't have them to hand at the moment. They are happening later on in the year, in the new financial year. I'm happy to furnish you with the details outside of the meeting if that helps. Is there a supplementary question there? No, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Singh, would you put your question, please? So I'll have another go. Um, question to the Leader of the Council. Because of the alleged anti-Sikhism that I've experienced from a particular party in this city... No, no, Councillor Singh, that, that's... Just your question, please. Just your question. OK, just my question. So, given the recent experiences, what is the Leader of the Council... Or what assurances can the leader give to members of diverse communities who will be looking at putting themselves forward as potential candidates in the up and coming elections? We got there in the end, I think, Councillor Singh, with a question, and I'm more than happy to, uh, to try to give you an answer. As you mentioned earlier, Plymouth does lie um, at the extremities in the southwest, but we actively encourage um, all faiths, religions, nationalities to come and visit Plymouth to make it their home. And I'm very uh, pleased that uh, with this administration, we appointed you as the chair of the Equalities and Diversity Board to ensure that minority groups were represented and their views and thoughts were very much considered and acted upon. In terms of the diversity, I think your question was with regards to people putting themselves forward as candidates to be Plymouth City Councillors. I would actively encourage any person that meets the eligibility criteria who feels passionate about their city and their local community to step forward. And certainly from this council's um, reputation, from the staff, I'm not aware of a huge amount of issues. I appreciate your own personal experiences have not been particularly great and they are well documented. But in terms of this administration and this council, I think with the commission that we set up, of which you chair, and indeed recent meetings where the Romanian community have been invited into the council house, and I had the honor and privilege of talking to a lot of those groups. Equally, we celebrated uh, Hanukkah outside the council house. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend because of COVID uh, I had myself. Those are very, very clear steps forward that this city, this council, this administration want everybody to feel valued. And I think the greater diversity that this city council has, and indeed the city, makes it a richer and better tapestry um, for our economy and our future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor, do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Singh? Yeah, sorry, I was, I was just going to rudely interrupt and remind you of supplementary. Uh, thank you to the Leader of the Council. And what I would say in response to my supplementary is that as long as there is the support from... A question, a supplementary question, Councillor Singh. I'll leave it. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Coun Councillor Lang. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is to Councillor Mrs Pengeli. Um, as the portfolio holder with responsibility for the issue of violence against women and girls, especially following that really important debate with excellent contributions from councillors of all ilks. Um, and it's about Councillor Kelly's readmittance to the Conservative group with no apology or response to a letter from women councillors following his remarks, which caused enormous offence locally and nationally. Uh, he could have contributed to the debate today and apologised. Um, so, can we have a question, yeah, please, Councillor Lang? Thank you. Uh, do you agree with me that his continued silence 
undermines the assertion that this issue is a priority and that your group takes this issue seriously. Thank you. Well, I, I'm struggling too, to be honest. I can, well, I'll say it again if you like. Do you agree with me that his continued silence, Councillor Kelly's that is, undermines the assertion that this issue is a priority and that your group takes this issue seriously? Thank you. No, I don't agree. Um, I do. Um, are you able to give us an explanation of how your party decided he was forgiven for those remarks after an, uh, an investigation, the findings of which have been kept secret? Thank you. Um, Councillor Lang, I'm not responsible for what other people do or say. It, this isn't for this meeting, Councillor Lang. Honestly, it's not. Um, <laughs> It, it's an association issue, I understand. Um, Councillor Evans. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this is a question to the portfolio holder for adult social care and health. Um, I spent the weekend knocking uh, on many doors across Plymouth, and in my scores of conversations that I had, I couldn't find one person that was aware of the fact that in a few weeks' time, the Conservative government are about to reintroduce prescription charges for people aged between 60 and 66. I suppose I ought to declare an interest as somebody who is in that zone. The point is, uh, my question to Councillor Nicholson is, does he agree with the government's policy and intention to reintroduce prescription charges for people aged between the age of 60 and 66. Um, through you, Lord Mayor, clearly it's a, a national government um, decision, Councillor Evans. I'll be absolutely honest, I wasn't aware of it myself, to be honest. Um, so it, it does come as some surprise, but ultimately we're in local government, have to um, adhere to our parliamentarians and our government decisions. So it's a, it's a matter that clearly the government have decided upon uh, and one that unfortunately we at a local level um, will have to adhere to. So you know, I'm, I'm obviously here to, to assist and run the local government services and these matters, if people are concerned, should be taken up with members of parliament. Supplementary, Councillor Evans. Uh, well, thank you for admitting that you didn't know about it. Now you do. Um, will you please, on behalf of every 60 to 66 year old in the city of Plymouth, please inform the government and your local MPs that, you, that uh, it is not the position of this authority that we mildly and meekly accept government policy when it is wrong. Uh, we, we had reference to the cost of living crisis earlier on today. The people who will suffer the most with this policy are people with long-term conditions who have to have regular medication. And this is basically uh, a health tax on them. So will you please help to campaign to stop this health tax being introduced in the next few weeks? Lord Mayor, I'm very happy to uh, make representations to local members of Parliament and express the concerns that, that have been raised at this meeting. You know, clearly those that have to pay uh, prescription charges, um, you know, there, there are uh, means tests for those that can't afford to pay. But clearly, you know, this is an issue you've raised, Councillor Evans, quite rightly in this Council meeting, and I'm more than happy to pass concerns that have been raised today to members of Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Philip Partridge. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. This is a question for the Cabinet <laughs> Member for Highways, Councillor Jonathan Dreen. Councillor Dreen, um, is it possible, um, after having talks with a traffic enforcement officer in my ward, um, is it possible to add parking on pavements as a, a a finable offence to their PDAs. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Councillor Partridge. Um, this, is, this is quite an emotive subject, and there is meant to be legislation coming from London, from, from Westminster, so that local authorities can do this in the future. At the moment, it hasn't arrived yet, 
we, we have lots of people, whether they're in uh, a wheelchair or mobility scooter, for example, driving on roads because there are cars blocking the pavement. Um, so we are looking to see what we can do. Um, and as soon as I hear some information, I'm happy to come back and share it with you. But it, we are waiting for legislation to come down from the government. Councillor Partridge, do you have a supplementary? No supplementary, my Lord Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Chas Singh, please. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is to Councillor Dr John Mahoney. Um, as unregistered data controllers, should an elected member breach the Data Protection Act, are we, all 57 of us, in their councillor capacity covered under insurance from the council, or can we all be individually prosecuted as a criminal act? Thank you, Councillor Singh. Uh, members could be subject to a claim for a breach of the data protection legislation where they are acting as a data controller in their own right. In general terms, I think if you're acting as a ward councillor and you receive an email and you forward it on to somebody within the PCC network, that should not be a problem. But of course, if there is sensitive material, you may wish to ask for permission and also if you're sending it outside of the Plymouth City Council family. Members are included in the list of entities to be indemnified under the Council's liability policies, which extend to provide cover for data protection breaches should a li legal liability attach. But any deliberate acts or omissions are not covered. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary there? Yes, I do, Singh. Lord Mayor. Thank you. So my supplementary is that if a breach happens from the councillor's email, is it a breach by the council or is it a breach by the councillor? Thank you, councillor Singh. I think partly it refers back to my previous answer, but when it comes to the processing of data, councillors have three different roles. They represent their ward and in this capacity are controllers in their own right, separate from the council. Secondly, they act as members of the council, for example, as cabinet members or members of a committee. And in this capacity, the council is either solely or jointly a controller with the councillors. And thirdly, they may act as members of a political party. And in this capacity, they're again controllers in their own right, separate from the council. It would therefore depend on the relevant circumstances surrounding any breach as to the capacity a councillor was acting in and whether there was also a breach by the council. Thank you, Dr. John Mahoney. Um, Councillor Jeremy Gosling. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. My question is for Councillor Deacon. Uh, in response to the prepared answer he gave to a previous question, um, outlining changes, plans for improvements or modifications to the library service, I'd like to ask for his assurance that uh, as part of any future plans of the Conservative administration, the Council would not see any further closures of local libraries across our city. Can you give me that assurance now? It's a moment with the technology. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, and thank you, um, Councillor Goslin. Um, what I can give the assurance is that um, I will resist any um, closures to um, libraries um, as far as, as I'm um, in control of them. Um, and um, I can reasonably say that hopefully there won't be any, any um, closures to libraries while, while they're in, in um, council control. Thank you. Councillor Gosling, do you have a supplementary? I do have a supplementary. Since Councillor Deacon is the Cabinet leader uh, with control over the libraries, then surely he should not be able, she, she would not need to resist these plans since he has that portfolio. So I repeat my question, will you be able to give those assurances that no local libraries will be changed under plans for modifications to the library service under the Conservative administration? Can you give that assurance, yes or no. Bear with us on the technology. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Councillor Goslin, for your um, supplementary question. Um, we are going to um, do some work uh, later on this year uh, regarding uh, possible changes to how we deliver the library service. Um, but um, um, I can um, positively say that um, I don't envisage any library closures. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dinkin. Thank you, Councillor Gosling. Councillor Pauline Murphy. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, my question is also to Councillor Deacon. Um, if Councillor Deacon can recall at the last council meeting, I did ask him a question of why no poppies were put across the city um, for our remembrance. Um, he did ask me to send him an email, which I actually did the, uh, on the 23rd of November at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, I'm still waiting a response on that question that was asked, or does Councillor Deacon feel that our armed forces community don't deserve a response? Thank you, Councillor, for that um, question. Um, I deeply respect the armed um, services, and, um, and they do... Um, and deserve a, a response, right. but unfortunately, Councillor, you're talking to um, the one portfolio holder. Um, and the um, lack of um, poppies in the Citadel actually um, belongs to the, um, the Lord Mayor's um, office and not my portfolio. Thank you. Um, Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Deacon, if you were aware of that, you still could have responded to my email to inform me on that fact. Um, you, are, you are the portfolio holder for offence, so you would be involved in this. So can I ask again, when will I get a response to this question? Councillor Murphy. Um I did um, ask my um, events team to respond to you. Um, if they haven't responded, then um, I shall ask them again. But um, I did do something about it, and I can reiterate again that I got every respect for the for the armed services in Plymouth and and also this country. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Eddie Rennie. Thank you, my Lord Mayor. It's to Councillor Dream, please, Jonathan. Um, you may not be aware, Jonathan, but the, um, sorry, Councillor Dream, I apologise, Councillor Dream. Um, within our ward, Mount Goldwright, there's some roads which quite simply are actually third, third world standard. Um, there were repairs did in one of our streets, right, which actually fell apart after a few months. Would you be willing to come around, maybe myself, my two colleagues at a convenient time, and have a look at these roads and sort of respond to our residents' concerns? Because honestly, they are bad and they need responding to uh, thank you, Councillor Rennie, for the question. Yes, of course, I'll be happy to come. What I'll do is I'll actually bring an inspector out with me because um, I'm obviously physically not qualified on the technical side of, of the defects, etc. but I'm more than happy to come. We'll see if we can get something in the diary, and I'll bring a qualified instru instru in, not instructor, inspector out with me. Sorry, get my teeth right today. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jonathan. Sorry, Councillor Dream. I do respect that, but I'm, as I said, we have been approached by quite a few residents, and to be honest, some of these streets, are, well, they are literally pulling pieces of gravel in some cases with people driving along, and it has been causing problems to people's motor cars where things have been sprayed up. So um, any Councilor response Rennie, would be helpful, Councilor please. Councillor Rennie, it is really casework that you're asking. Yeah, no, um, so uh, Councillor Dreen has offered to deal with that for you. Thank I know, you. Lord, I'm trying it on a bit. Thank you. <laughs> I know you were trying it. Um, Councillor Singh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, my question is to Chair of Planning, Councillor Rebecca Smith. Um, kind of, I don't want to say it's casework related, but I've had emails from people across the city in regards to a development in Greenbank and the overbuild of a, a story. Could you tell me how far enforcement is with it? Yeah. Can 
You're happy to answer that, Councillor Smith. Thank you. It is casework, though, and we don't I have know, case work brought to full council. Rebecca, Rebecca Smith is offered to answer the question. I'm fully aware of casework, and as Councillor Singh knows, he had an email earlier on from enforcement who have been responding in, in what I consider a timely fashion to the queries. I'm as concerned as he is. It's literally around the corner from where I have very close family and used to live myself. Every time I drive from Plimstock, I see it, so it's fresh in my mind at all junctures across the city because it sits, stands up so high above the skyline. So you have my assurances that it's on my radar, and as I'm sure you will have seen. Um, Thank you. He did reply today. Thank you. I get pulled up time and time again when I'm sat down there for doing casework. Um, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, it's a question for Councillor Downey. Um, following on from Dr Ruth Horrell's report earlier and the issue of COVID measures in schools, can you confirm if ventilators have been allocated to Plymouth schools and if so, how many? Certainly, thank you very much, Lord Mayor. Through you, uh, as far as I know, Councillor, the number of ventilators uh, nationally are actually extremely limited. And when I spoke to the Director of Education last week, there, there, he wasn't aware of any ventilators being situated in Plymouth schools. Do you have a supplementary? I do, Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, if that's the case, this seems like you know, Plymouth being left behind again by the politicians. Will Councillor Downey seek to bid for ventilators to protect the safety and health of the children of our city? Okay, thank you. I don't think it's a case of Plymouth being left behind. Uh, as far as I was aware, there were 6,000 ventilators nationally. So it's not just Plymouth that's... I don't know if we're losing out because I don't know if there's actually becoming a need for them now. Windows are still open, children are still wearing masks, so the whole ventilator issue may change later this week when the new guidelines are issued as well. But we've never been left behind. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Because my list is expired. Councillor Singh. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, this is for Councillor Maddie Bridgman. Um, the ward and the city has huge amounts of fly tipping across and I've noticed there has been an increase in enforcement. Um, would you be looking at operating a zero tolerance on fly tipping? Councillor Singh, I am. <laughs> um, the first thing, well, one of the first things or recently that I have actually done is actually include, um, increase the fixed penalty notice. Um, and I've actually got some details here that because I was really hoping someone's going to ask this question. Um, because in our continued drive to tackle environmental crimes, the littering, graffiti and fly posting, fixed penalty notices have now been increased £150 um, to keep up to date with enforcement activities. In our environmental enforcement Facebook pages and on our website, there's lots of information on there as well about um, the cases that we brought to court recently. Um, so absolutely yes, there's no need for it. We've got the bulky waste collections back um, and we really are camping down. We have had a little bit of a glitch with... Um, recruitment because two people were going to start and then they didn't start but actually that team are working incredibly hard and I've got some figures here as well that I could actually forward you by email because they're quite a bit, bit to actually read out today I think I'd bore everyone with numbers and we're all probably quite tired after today's um, level of debate etc so I'm very happy to forward these to you um, tomorrow if that's okay thank you for the question to you, Do you have a supplementary Councillor Singh yeah, my supplementary is, so given that you've increased the fines, have you found that there has been an increase or a decrease in fly tipping across the city? Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, it's only very recent. I only took it to Cabinet a couple of weeks ago, so it's, it's very, very new, but they are increased. They have increased, so hopefully that is the aim. Um, you know, so, yeah, hopefully this will be a really positive move. Thank you very much for the question, Councillor Singh. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor Lang. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Mayor. My question is for Councillor Downey, just following on from Councillor Allen's question around ventilation systems. I think it's quite glib to say, just open the windows. We're in the middle of some very, very cold weather. We've been in here this afternoon and the windows aren't open and I'm freezing. Um, could we ask that you make the case for Plymouth to get an allocation uh, of one of these ventilation systems? If they weren't necessary, I assume the government wouldn't be sending them out. So. Um, could we ask that you would make the case for, 
for Plymouth schools that need them to get one, please. Thank you. Certainly, and let me clarify, I wasn't being glib, I was actually just reiterating government information and guidelines. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Lang? Uh, no, I do have a supplementary. Um, uh, I just wondered if you could tell us what um, action you might take to make the case for ventilation systems in Plymouth schools. If other schools are getting them in other cities, um, I, I take your point that there are places that haven't got them, but actually it's Plymouth that we're talking about. It's Plymouth that we represent. Um, so could you just tell me what shape you think your lobbying on that matter might take? Thank you. Certainly. I'm sure uh, the Director of Education has actually lobbied and put in bids for ventilators to be sent to Plymouth. So far, because they are very limited nationally, we have been unsuccessful, but we shall keep trying and trying if they are deemed necessary. Thank you. Councillor Sue MacDonald. Thank you, Chair. My question is also about the ventilators. It makes no sense to me why there are four or five times as many schools as there are ventilators. So I don't understand the rationale behind this policy at all, and I would welcome some information because it must be completely randomised because I can't see the logic in no schools in Plymouth and several in other cities. What's the question, please? Well, the question is why. Um, so obviously you can't answer that, Councillor Downey, but could you look more into that? Because it's, it's a crazy policy. Certainly. If you could clarify the question in writing, Councillor MacDonald, then I will get an answer to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tudor. Thank you very much, Lord Mayor. I'm intrigued uh, by Councillor Downey's statement, and I just want to make sure it's absolutely on the record that of the 7,000 ventilation systems, well, they're, they're not ventilation systems, are they? They're air conditioning units that were promised to cover the entirety of the UK. Is it, fit, is it right to say, correct to say, that Plymouth hasn't been allocated a single one? Is that what he is saying? That is my recollection of my last conversation with uh, Ming Zhang, yes. In which case, Lord Mayor, my supplementary would be what efforts is the Cabinet making to make sure that the MPs for this city raise that issue as a matter of urgency? And can we please review the uh, bids that we have made that have been unsuccessful in order that we can ascertain why we have been unsuccessful. Councillor Downey said that he was sure that uh, the Director of Education had made the bids, and so I think we have a right to see uh, and find out why we had been turned down. Are Plymouth children's lives not worth it the same as other children in other cities? Thank you, Councillor Evans. Councillor Downey? Yes, I'll get the appropriate responses to Councillor Evans as soon as I can. Thank you, Councillor Downey. Are there any other questions? Well, it's been an absolute delight sitting here this afternoon. Um, thank you so much for your contributions, um, uh, particularly to the motion on notice, which I found really, really powerful. So thank you, councillors, and I hope you all have a pleasant evening. Thank you.